honorable members of uh, the provincial legislatures. Um, uh, also, good morning to our panelists, uh, Professor uh, Owen Dean and uh, uh, our panelists from the CIPC. Uh, also, good morning to the staff of the uh, parliament, uh, the committee, the advocate uh, Fanameve from the legal unit, uh, staff from the communication unit uh, of parliament, uh, PMG, uh, uh, stakeholders and observers uh, on this process of uh, lawmaking. Uh, good morning to everyone. So the PLOs uh, from our provinces. Uh, good morning. Uh, we this morning we continuing uh, with the workshop. Last week our focus was on the copyright uh, law. Um, uh, this morning we will be dealing then with the performance protection. Um, and then in the afternoon we will then get the briefing on both the, the copyright as well as the uh, performance the protection. The department uh, led by uh, the deputy minister will be here uh, in the afternoon. I see some members of uh, or, or officials from the department are here. I've seen uh, Saroj is also here uh, 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 from the department. Uh, but in the afternoon, we'll be joined by uh, Deputy Minister Majola. We'll be making a opening remarks uh, on the two bills and then hand over uh, to the DDG responsible uh, for the, uh, the program that deals with the legislation in the department. Um, as I indicated, uh, then after that, um, uh, the members will then be allowed to ask questions for clarities, both uh, the members from the uh, National Council of Provinces, as well as the uh, provincial uh, legislatures uh, members. Um, then after that, then uh, Advocate uh, Fanameva will just give us an overview uh, of the uh, Constitutional Court uh, outcome. Uh, on the uh, principal act uh, on copyright. Uh, but the further details and analysis will further be uh, uh, communicated in, in, in other meetings of the committee uh, when we deal with the DTIC. Uh, there's still a number of uh, meetings that we'll be having with the DTIC other than just the, the legislation, uh, but other briefings. Uh, so we'll deal with the full analysis when uh, we have one of the meetings. Um, let me then uh, hand over uh, to uh, advocate. Oh, first, let me uh, hand over to uh, Ms. Madir uh, to indicate uh, members who are present uh, and also the provinces that are present and also if there are any apologies. Over to you, Ms. Madir. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Um, in terms of the members of our committee of president, of present, we have yourself, Honorable Moiman, Honorable Boshop, Honorable Lant, Honorable Brautsi. I know that Honorable um, Matabula was trying to get in, um, and we've got one apology from Honorable Mushodi. Um, in terms of provinces, I have had confirmations from um, the Western Cape Provincial Legislature, the Mpumalanga Provincial Legislature. Um, I um I can't really speak to the other confirmations that I haven't received yet. Okay, no, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, as I indicated, uh, perhaps uh, the one point that uh, I left out is that also in the program they will deal with the the process uh, that we will be taking after having received then the briefing and also members have engaged uh, with the briefings, and then we outline uh, the process that uh, will be uh, taking both uh, in the committee as well as uh, in, the, in the provincial legislatures. Yeah, so that's one of the items that we'll be dealing with. At this stage, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, uh, Advocate Fanameve and uh, request her uh, uh, to facilitate uh, the next uh, process. Over to you, uh, Advocate. 
Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to you and good morning to all the members. Um, Chair, the first uh, presenter in our panel this morning um, is not a stranger to, to the members. He also assisted members last week on the copyright. Um, so it is Dr. Owen Dean. And uh, maybe just to remind members uh, who this is that will be talking to you. Um, he has uh, he, he's done his BA LLB at Stellenbosch, and then also he's got a doctorate in copyright from Stellenbosch. He practiced as a specialist copyright attorney with an emphasis on litigation with Spoor and Fisher, which is a leading intellectual property law firm. Um, he practiced with them for 48 years, and he um, conducted in excess of 50 high court copyright cases during that time. He also set up and operated the Chair of Intellectual Property Law at the Stellenbosch University as a professor. And he is also the author of a handbook for South African copyright law, which is a standard textbook on the subject and an authority that is frequently quoted by courts. He's also the principal editor of Introduction to Intellectual Property Law, which is used as a textbook in South African universities. Uh, Dr. Dean has published in excess of 100 articles in South African and international legal journals, and he served for 20 years on the Minister's Statutory Intellectual Property Advisory Committee, as well as Chairman of the Copyright Subcommittee. He was also a Principal Draftsman of Eight of Copyright Amendment Acts and Speaker on Copyright at numerous domestic and local seminars, including on behalf of WIPO. It's also a member of the WIPA panel of arbitrators. So um, if I can welcome um, Dr. Dean and, and uh, to assist the members on uh, performance protection. Uh, Dr. Dean, you have, I see from the agenda, 50 minutes. So as we did last week at about 40 minutes, I will switch my camera on, which will give you an indication that you have 10 minutes left. Thank you very much. Um, if we could just have uh, Dr. Dean's slides shared for him, please. Uh, good. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Chairman of the of the meeting. Uh, once again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, present at this this um, committee meeting, and uh, I hope I can be of some assistance to the members of the committee. So, my task now is to talk about the Performance Protection Act as it currently exists. Um, can I have the uh, next slide, please? Now, when you give consideration to the Performance Protection Act, it's important to distinguish between performance protection and, uh, and copyright. Um, there is some affinity between the two. One can almost regard uh, performance protection as a cousin of, of, of copyright, but there are also very significant differences uh, between the two bodies of law. Um, I must say there are certain conventions which have probably been passed in recent years relating to performance protection, um, uh, which uh, are conventions which no doubt we will aspire to join. We are not currently members of them. And they have the effect of bringing um, performance protection a little closer to, to copyright than, than it is at, uh, at the moment. Now, copyright pr protects works. Um, we heard last week what works they are, I won't enumerate them all, but um, the most important ones are literary, music, artistic works, uh, cinematograph films, etc. So the subject of the protection is the um, material expression of the, of the author's um, intellectual uh, output. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a material object that is being uh, protected. When you come to a performance, it is the, the delivery or the rendition of, the, of, of a work that one is protecting. Um, to give you an example, um, what I'm busy doing now is I am actually presenting a work to you. The, the slides um, which are before you and uh, the written text, which I've also um, supplied and which I think has probably been distributed to you, is the work which I am performing. So these slides are protected by copyright and my delivering these the, 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 in the content of these slides to you this morning is my performance. 
uh, the two are, are quite um, uh, closely connected, uh, but there is a distinction. Um, the, 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 um, the subject matter of the copyright is, is a material object, and the subject matter of, of, of the performance protection is my sitting here and delivering the content of the slides to you. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Now, the Performance Protection Act um, relates to the performance of works. Uh, and I'll just read to you what the, the Act actually says in this connection. It says, the performances protected by the Act are those of actors, singers, musicians, dancers, and other persons who act, sing, deliver, declaim, play, or otherwise perform literary music dramatic and dramatico musical and artistic works and expressions of folklore. So what is being performed is a work. Now the Performance Protection Act doesn't actually define what it means by a work, but um, since we're dealing with intellectual property and as I mentioned, performance protection is really the cousin of, um, of, of copyright, um, it is necessary to give the term work the same interpre interpretation as it has in the Copyright Act. So this means that a performance of um, something which isn't scripted, which is uh, an impromptu performance. Um, imagine a, a juggler stands up on a stage and he starts juggling a whole bunch of balls. He's not delivering a work. So his performance would not be protected by the Performance Protection Act. Now, as with um, copyright, um, there is a treaty involved um, uh, in providing the law on this, uh, on this, in this area. And that is firstly the, the Rome Convention, uh, which protects performers, and also the TRIPS Agreement. Now, we heard about the TRIPS Agreement um, last week, and the TRIPS Agreement is an agreement uh, of the World Trade Organization, and it it provides that uh, members of, of that agreement, of which we are one, must um, apply the, the, the provisions of the Rome Convention. So we actually never ever joined the Rome Convention, but by virtue of the fact that we are a member of TRIPS and TRIPS obliges us to adopt it, we are indirectly a member of the Rome Convention. And our Performance Protection Act is really designed to give effect to the provisions of the, of the Rome Convention. It, the common law protects what is known as personality rights. That is the right to your reputation and the right to your um, uh, personal uh, uh, confidentiality and so forth. And performance protection rights are a little akin to personality rights. They, they really attach to the, the, the person of the, uh, of the, perform the performer, the per person giving the performance. So um, there is this somewhat strange relationship between copyright and performance protection. Now, our Performance Protection Act dates from 1967, and it has retrospective effect, which means that um, even though it only came into operation in 1967, it's still, um, or not still, it, it actually ex post facto gives protection to performances that were made prior to 1967. Now, when you talk of a performance that is being protected, um, it is each and every performance which a performer does. So for instance, um, what, as I've said, what I'm now doing as we sit here or as, as we are presently engaged with, I am delivering a performance. That performance is protected. If tomorrow I go and deliver this same um, presentation to uh, a group of students, for instance, that is another performance, and it is separately protected from the one that I'm giving today. So each and every time I deliver this presentation, I am making a new performance, and each of those performances has its own protection as a, a separate entity. That's important to remember because um, Think, for instance, of a, a 
pop singer who's doing a, um, a tour of South Africa, he might appear in 10 different cities and he might give three performances in a day. And each performance in that day is a separate performance and enjoys its own protection. That's unlike copyright where you have an original work and that's that's the work which is protected forever hereafter. There's, there's only one work and, and the copyright attaches to it. As I say, as I want to emphasize that with the performance, each and every performance is a separate, call it work, it's perhaps the wrong term, but a separate item which enjoys protection. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, as with copyright, um, there are certain conditions that must be met for a performance to enjoy protection. Like copyright, it, it, it is not registered and uh, the protection exists automatically. Um, one needs, takes no steps at all to, to obtain protection. And the, the, it's the law giving protection to this performance actually creates an item of property. It's an intangible item of property because um, you, can't, you can't touch it and uh, it, it exists in theory more than, in, than as a practical reality. And as I've said before, each and every performance is a separate property item. Um, so when I, if I do this um, presentation tomorrow, I'm creating another additional property item. And it is effectively scripted works, as I've said. Um, the uh, juggler, for instance, who's not walk, working according to a script, he's just doing something impromptu, his, um, his protection wouldn't be uh, protected, his performance. Um, one of the, the items which is specifically enumerated as being a work, the performance of which can be protected is folklore or traditional works. Um, that is a little bit of a, of a, a sort of uh, a, an exception, not exception to that, but it, it's an unusual uh, form of presentation because sometimes um, folklore and traditional works may not exist in a material form. They've been done over generations and centuries and they have a fixed content, but they're not actually, um, or may not actually be reduced into some material form such as writing or uh, a, a, a video or a movie or whatever, but the, um, the the copyright, I mean, the Performance Protection Act actually specifically says that performances of folklore and traditional works are also entitled to protection. Next slide, please. So, what are the conditions which must be met for protection to subsist in um, a performance? They firstly deal with the place of performance. Um, and that means that uh, a performance which takes place in South Africa or in a country which is a member of the TRIPS agreement, uh, which is virtually the whole world, um, in principle, well, yeah, in principle uh, is entitled to protection in South Africa. So the, um, that's the first condition which can give you performance protection. Um, the second is form is if, 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 the, if it's broadcasted live in South Africa or a TRIPS country. And the third possibility is that if it is first recorded in South Africa or a um, TRIPS country. Um, the basis of international protection in general in intellectual property is reciprocity. Uh, you find this is provided for in the Berne Convention with regard to copyright. And what that means is that each member country must grant to foreign works from other member countries the same protection as it gives to its, its own works. That's in copyright. And that, that principle is known as national treatment. Um, and the, the, the outcome of that is that um, in copyright, if a work is made in South Africa, it is automatically protected throughout the world uh, in terms of that reciprocal arrangement. Now, our Performance Protection Act specifically says that foreign performances are only protected in South Africa 
to the same extent and in the same way as our performances would be protected in those other countries. That's a different proposition to the um, uh, national treatment, which I, uh, I described. National treatment says you must protect foreign works in the same way as you protect your own works. What our Performance Protection Act says, we will only protect foreign works in the same way as those countries, or the countries from which those, those performances uh, emanate, protect South African performances. So there's not the same degree of reciprocity um, in, in, in performance protection law um, as there is in, in copyright. Next slide, please. So sorry, before we, well, just, can I just go back to that slide? So provided one of these conditions are met, the place of the performance or the place of the broadcast um, or the first recording of the broadcast is, is met, South Africa or one of the other member countries, um, the performance protection right exists automatically. Okay, next slide. As in copyright, um, there is a limited um, term of protection. Um, once again, the magic figure is, is 50 years. Um, for performance protection, um, it is the, the protection lasts for 50 years after the performance took place. Or if it is, um, the performance was recorded in, in, in uh, some form of, of, of device, CD or whatever, um, 50 years from the time the recording was made. So as I said, the magic fi figure is, is 50 years. So coming back to my, my point about each performance um, uh, being a separate item of, of, of property, my performance that I'm giving you now will be protected for 50 years until the 50 years after the 24th of, of, of October, um, 2022. If I give a, a similar performance to students tomorrow, that performance will be protected until the 25th of October, 20 over 50 years hence. So this once again re-emphasizes the fact that each individual performance is a separate item of property. Next slide, please. So now what in VAC, what in, 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 in practice does the Performance Protection Act give to performers by way of protection? The first point is that the, the rights which vest in the performance um, belong to the performer. As in the case of copyright, where the author is in general the first owner of the, the copyright, in, in the case of performance protection, the performer is the, the owner of the item of property which comes into being by virtue of the performance. Now that item of property gives a monopoly to the performer in respect of certain acts known as restricted acts. Here again, there's a, uh, a close parallel with the Copyright Act because the Copyright Act also gives authors um, protection in respect of a whole bundle of restricted acts. The restricted acts in the case of um, a performance are somewhat more limited than uh, in the case of, for instance, a, a musical work uh, under the Copyright Act. And the restricted acts are set out in, in the slide and in the next one. Um, and they are broadcasting or communicating an unfixed performance. In other words, that's um, a live performance. So when I give a live performance, um, I'm entitled to control the broadcasting or the communicating of my live performance. Uh, once it's been recorded, then it's no longer an unfixed performance. But while it's an unfixed performance, I can control broadcasting and communicating. Secondly, I can control making a recording of a live performance. 
Um, I'm sure most of you will have been to um, stage productions or plays or performances of one form or another on a stage where it is often said that um, there is, it is prohibited to make videos or uh, take photographs of the performance. Um, that is a commonplace um, warning which is given at these sort of um, events. And that is giving effect to this right on the part of the performer that he can control the making of the recording of his live performance. And then the next restricted act is making reproductions of a recording of a performance. So um, I can authorize a record company to record my performance, but the record company requires a further permission to reproduce um, that initial recording. Next slide, please. This restricted act setting out here is, is, is one which is very topical and, and, and very controversial. It's, it's quite a new um, addition to our Performance Protection Act. Um, it's known as needle time. And that means by means of a commercial record, in other words, the record made by a, a record company, um, without paying the performer a royalty, broadcasting the performance using the record, transmitting the performance in the diffusion service using the record, and communicating the performance to the public using the record. So what we're dealing with here is no longer a live performance. A, um, a recording has been made of that performance and um, I, as a performer, can control the, um, the broadcasting, transmission, and communication of that record. Um, and that en enables me, at the end of the day, to impose payment of a royalty on the record company, uh, or not on the record company, a royalty on the person who wants to use uh, the record for performing my, or giving the rendition of my performance. This leads us into quite a complicated area um, because the sound recording itself, in other words, the, the product of the record company also has similar, similar rights to these. So um, when the um, SABC uses a record to broadcast my performance, um, the SABC requires a license from me as the performer to use the record to show my performance, but it also needs a license from the, from the record company to make a public performance of the record. Um, there's very fine distinctions in intellectual property law, and um, it's, it's actually important to analyze situations very carefully to see what rights are involved and who isn't able to claim payment of royalties or prohibit the use of, of the works. It can, of course, get even more complicated because um, supposing I'm a singer and uh, I have uh, uh, singing a song on as part of my performance, um, more works come into play because um, the song is a musical work and the or the, the melody of the song is a, is a musical work and the the lyrics of the song are a literary work so a whole bundle of rights owners can get into the act here and require payment of royalties and uh, or exercise control over the, uh, the the record being used to to to, to give a public performance and how all of those rights hang together and can be properly administrated is one of the most difficult and in South Africa controversial aspects of, of this area of the law. 
Um, can we have the next slide, please? So, the performer has a right of property in his performance. Uh, he can authorize or not authorize the restricted acts which fall within the scope of his, of his rights of property. Um, these are the restricted acts. If a restricted act, any one of the restricted acts is performed without the permission of the uh, performer, um, then we have infringement. And that's the same with copyright. In copyright, you have restricted acts for um, a literary work, um, reproduction, making adaptations, and so forth. And if that is, those acts are performed without the copyright and its permission, you have civil copyright infringement. So in this respect, um, uh, performance protection is more or less on all fours with, with copyright um, and the way copyright protects works. So the, the consent of the performer is the, is the material issue here. And um, what can often arise in practice is um, a determination of whether in any given search situation, consent has been given. And it's very important to be able to decide that issue because it's the difference between uh, valid or, or legitimate use of, of a performance and infringing use of a performance. Now, the, the Act, Performance Protection Act, has provisions which deal with this issue of consent and um, uh, can mitigate the, 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 the requirement that, that the individual performer must give the consent. So there are situations uh, where other persons or, or circumstances can give rise to a consent. And the first of those is the collective consent by a manager of a group. Now you can imagine a group like um, um, Ladysmith back Babatha, where you have maybe 30 or I don't know how many people there are in the choir, but, but each of them is a performer. And uh, each of them has a right in respect of his or her personal performance. So anybody who wants to uh, make a record of a performance by Lady Smith, Black Mabatha, or um, broadcast it or perform any of the restricted acts needs to get the consent of each and every one of those performers. Now that can be quite a um, cumbersome and complicated process. And so the act says that um, in this situation, although the manager of the group actually holds no rights in his own capacity, uh, he can give consent on behalf of the entire group. That's a practical measure which makes the whole process somewhat more workable. Then there are instances where the, the act deems that consent has been given. And the first of those is when a broadcast has been authorized and the broadcaster at a later stage subsequently rebroadcasts re the, um, the performance. Uh, in that case, the rebroadcast is deemed to have been authorized by the, um, by the performer. And then the second item under number two on the slide deals with a situation where somebody who says, um, I'm the manager of this group um, and I give you consent to use the performances of all of the members of the group. And so you can go ahead. And it then turns out that that person, in fact, is not the manager and he doesn't have authority to, 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 to consent on behalf of all the performers. And, and here what the Act says, it, that says is that the person who uses the performance, um, believing that he has consent, can be deemed to have consent if it was reasonable 
that he could assume that he had consent. In other words, it's very difficult for a show producer or a broadcaster to, 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 to really know whether someone who says he's the manager actually is the manager. And so the, the law was not going to penalize the person who acts in good faith in, in, in that situation. Next slide, please. Of course, um, as in copyright law, um, when you're talking about um, infringement, whether it's civil or criminal, um, the act is an infringing act, doing the restricted act without consent, if it's done in respect of a substantial part of the item of property. So you don't have to, uh, if, you, you can infringe the performer's right in a performance, even if you do just an excerpt from it, as long as it is a substantial part. Now, um, the point is that as in copyright, the, um, the law makes or gives rise or makes provision for civil law infringement as well as criminal law infringement. Um, so in certain circumstances, infringing the performer's right can be a criminal offense, as can be the case with copyright. So when is it a criminal offense? Performing a restricted act in relation to a substantial part, distributing an infringing copy, that is a copy which was made without authority. Um, as it were, it was conceived in sin uh, because the person making the copy was not entitled to make it. And um, the person who distributes that infringing copy can also um, infringe copyright and in a criminal context. And the third uh, form of criminal uh, offense is possessing a master of the infringing copy. And by what is meant by that is that when a performance is recorded, the, the, the initial recording um, is known in practice as the master copy, because that is the, the, the version of the recorded um, performance, which is going to be used as the basis for multiplication. When records are issued, those records are made by reproducing that master. So the master is like a like a mold almost for for producing um, uh, infringing copies. So you can commit a criminal offence by possessing or making the master of an infringing copy. But in the case of all of these um, uh, infringing infringing activities, the accused must be shown to have so-called guilty knowledge. That means that the, the state must be able to show that the person knew when he committed the act, um, distributed the infringing copy, um, for instance, he knew that what he was working with was a, an infringing copy. So there is an, will be an onus on the state to prove that the, the person in the dock, the, the accused, actually knew that the copies that he were, was introduced or was distributing were um, infringing copies. Next slide, please. Now, in the case of civil law infringement, the, the remedies that are available to the performer are firstly an interdict. In other words, an order by the court which says that you are prohibited from continuing to perform the infringing act, um, distributing unlawful copies of the, um, uh, of the performance, for instance. Secondly, you can claim what is known as patrimonial damages. Uh, that means your, your actual losses, the extent to which you're out of pocket as a result of the um, offence being committed. Um, when you claim damages of that sort, there is an onus on the, uh, on the rights owner to, to, to actually demonstrate to the court that he has actually suffered uh, money, monetary damages, and he also has to quantify the amount of the damages. In other words, he has to come to court and say, and say to the court, I've suffered 10,000 rands worth of, of, of loss, 
And the way I've computed my 10,000 Rand is the following. And if the court agrees with all of that, then it will make a damages award. Now, that actually can be quite difficult in practice to, to put together that sort of evidence and, and that sort of, of information. And so the law um, looks for simpler alternatives to um, providing a means for the rights owner to get proper compensation for the infringement. And in this instance, the Performance Protection Act entitles the Minister of Trade and Industry to specify penalties um, in an amount which he determines which can be a substitute for having to prove the actual damages. Um, there's a similar provision to this in American copyright law, and what the, the way the, copy, the American um, uh, law refers to this situation is they call it statutory damages. So this is virtually statutory damages, um, which leads me to the next point. Um, there's the, not really much difference between the penal damages and the statutory damages, um, which the minister is able to, to specify. And then also the rights owner can uh, obtain an order from the court just providing for the destruction of the master copies. Obviously, if you destroy the master copies, then it becomes impossible for the... Um, the infringer to, to carry on with his infringement in any event. I mean, the, the first remedy, the interdict, puts a prohibition on his carrying on the, in, the unlawful acts. But by destroying the masters, you, you have a sort of a belt and braces approach because you take away from him the wherewithal to make the infringing copies anyway. And then finally, the court can award costs to the um, the performer, um, if he is successful in his case. So that's what lies in store for you as a performer if you decide to sue somebody for um, infringing your performance right. Next um, uh, slide, please. We now look at the, the criminal sanctions for infringement. So these are the, are the um, penalties that the criminal court can impose on an infringer when he has infringed the performer's protection right. Um, the first is a fine and or, or imprisonment. The second is a little bit akin to the penalty damages under the, um, in the civil proceedings. The, um, the court can, um, in addition to prov uh, providing a normal fine, it can provide a second fine, um, which the infringer must pay to the performer. Normally, when a criminal court imposes a fine, the, the, the money actually goes to the state. It doesn't go to the, the, the victim or the uh, aggrieved person. Um, but in the case of performance protection, there's this unusual provision that uh, the court can impose a normal fine, which goes to the state, and then it can impose a second fine, which is a lump sum, which the um, uh, infringer, the accused person, uh, has to pay to the, to the performer himself. And then finally, the, uh, in the criminal case, the um, court can also order the destruction of the master copies used for making the infringing copies. Next slide, please. Now, as in the case of copyright, um, there are situations in which public policy, uh, or the weighing up of the interests of the, um, uh, of the public at large against the interests of the, uh, the rights owner, um, and exceptions to the, the restricted acts or the infringement can, can be um, provided for. Um, now that happens in copyright law and it also happens in the uh, performance protection environment. Uh, there are these exceptions or exemptions. Um, the terms exception and ex exemption are almost synonymous, but 
uh, the exemption underlines a, a very important point, and that is that an exception only comes into play when infringement has taken place. If, if there has been no infringement, for instance, um, a less than a substantial part of a performance has been used, that's perfectly legitimate, and so no exception is, is necessary. So you only talk of an exception or an exemption when there has been use of at least a substantial part of the, uh, of the performance. Um, so the specific items that are identified in the Act as being attracting exceptions are private study and personal use. That is very similar to the Copyright Act. Criticism or review, there's an equivalent to that in the Copyright Act. Act. Use for teaching, scientific purposes, legal proceedings, demonstrating equipment, or recording equipment, and, and so forth. Um, that also, ha also has equivalents in the Copyright Act. And then um, finally, what is known as ephemeral recordings by a broadcaster. And what that means is that, and this also applies in copyright, if the, um, the rights owner gives, say, the SABC a license to broadcast uh, his performance in this case, um, it may not suit the broadcaster to do an actual live broadcast. He might want to postpone it until the next day, uh, postpone the broadcast until the next day. And in order to do that, he has to make a recording because it's not the live performance. And that recording made for temporary purposes in a, to enable a broadcast to take place at a later stage is referred to as an ephemeral um, recording or an ephemeral, ephemeral copy. And what the law, both Copyright Act and the um, uh, Performance Protection Act say is that you can, the broadcaster can make these ephemeral recordings subject to the condition that they are destroyed after the broadcast has taken place or within a certain period. So it's, it's, it's a temporary recording. It's not a, a recording that can be, um, um, kept for indefinitely. Next um, slide, please. Right, now how does the um, performer um, in fact generate income for his, um, his performance? Um, the most common way is to grant a license. Uh, in other words, if the SABC wants to broadcast uh, the performance of Lady Smith Black and Bartha, they um, go to the manager and he says, fine, you can make a broadcast of, of our performance, but uh, you're going to have to pay us 10,000 Rand. Uh, that is a royalty, um, which is payable in terms of the license, which is the permission to actually uh, broadcast the, the, the performance. Uh, and that's very similar to copyright. The, the, exactly the same situation uh, or, or provisions apply. Um, copyright can be assigned as well as licensed. Um, you may recall that when I spoke last week, I, I drew a distinction between an assignment and a license. I said that an assignment of, of, of copyright is like selling your house. You, um, you divest yourself completely of the um, ownership of the property. You kiss it goodbye, and thereafter, the person who acquires the right from you, the assignee, can do with it what he wants. He's the boss, and, and you're out of the picture. That's, that's an assignment. A license, on the other hand, is um, a permission to do something which is a, comparable to the lease of a property. When I rent a property, um, my own property, I'm renting, uh, putting a tenant into my property, I remain owner of the house. I mean, the fact that I'm allowing the tenant to occupy the house says nothing about my ownership of the right uh, of the property. What, what is in fact happening is that as the owner, I have the right to occupy the house. And I am uh, making that right available to my tenant. It's one of the rights which flow from, from owning a property. And um, as 
the, the normal situation, I would charge a monthly rental form for my property. That's like a, a license of a performance right or of copyright subject to royalty. Now, there is no provision in the Performance Act, P Performance Protection Act for the performer's right to be licensed. Um, and that then means that the performer actually cannot sell off his, his right um, or his property. I, I mentioned earlier that um, there is some degree of, of, of similarity between um, performer's rights and personality rights, like the right to your reputation. Uh, in the same way as you can't sell the right to your reputation, it attaches to you personally. So in terms of the Performance Protection Act, you cannot divest yourself of your performance right. It, it, it attaches to you as a person. Um, I find this quite surprising, quite honestly, because uh, performers' rights are intellectual property rights, and in the case of every other form of intellectual property, trademarks, copyright, patents, designs, the ownership of the, of, of the property can be assigned or transferred. So why this uh, is the position in the Performance Protection Act is, is not clear to me that it is something which is very personal to the performer. Um, next slide, please. That really brings me to the end of, um, of what I have to say about the Performance Protection Act. Um, it's actually, in some ways, quite a strange piece of legislation because it's been on the statute book now for about the best part of 50 years. And I'm only a one, aware of one case ever coming to the court um, uh, in terms of the Performance Protection Act. So either it, the law is not understood or it's perhaps not even known to uh, a vast uh, proportion of performers, or otherwise um, performers really don't see their way clear to trying to enforce these rights, which, which I find surprising because they, they, the, the rights are, have value and, uh, and they can, can be of, of, of benefit to performers. But be, as it, as, be it as it may, it is a very underutilized form of protection. And um, perhaps um, in future, when uh, the act is amended, um, performers will feel more inclined to, to exercise their rights. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dean. Um, then, uh, members, if I can introduce our next panelist, there will be an opportunity for discussion and questions after the next panelist has presented. Our next panel panelist is uh, Mr. Cardi Peche. He's a senior manager um, in copyright at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, CIPC, as you might know it. He has 18 years' experience in the intellectual property field and um, recording in progress. Sorry, and um, he represented the CIPC in the Copyright Review Commission, which was established by the Minister of Trade and Industry in 2010. He remains part of the South African delegation at the WIPO SCCR, and he is currently part of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition team on, the, on these bills. Um, he holds uh, both a BPROC and an LLB degree. Um, I'm aware that he has done a lot of training on, on these subject matters, and um, I'm sure he will bring a little bit of a practical perspective as well, uh, coming from, from the department that is implementing uh, these acts. Uh, thank you. If I can hand over to you, uh, Cardi, um, and then I'm not sure if it was arranged for you to share or for us to share your presentation. We do have it. If we can perhaps share it for him, please. Thank you. Oh, just, just to say, Cardi, I know that you've got 30 minutes. So at 20 minutes, I'll switch my camera on so that you know that there's 10 minutes left. Thank you.
Um, Gadi, are you ready? I can see that you are on the platform, but um, I'm not hearing anything. You are unmuted, so you should be able to speak. Oh, I, I see that you had uh, uh, a problem in respect of uh, connection. Cardi, are you here now? Um, apologies, members. It seems that we just have a bit of a problem. Um, Cardi, if you if you have a problem with your with your microphone, can you maybe just type a message for us so that we can just see uh, what the problem is, and then we can perhaps deal with that. Um, okay, so it seems that Cardi is having some problems in respect of his microphone. Uh, Marty, I now I'll have to ask you guys to assist um, in respect of the the technology challenge. Yeah, um, 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 if it's under America, I would actually recommend that um, he log in and um, log out the game. Um, beyond that, um, I think uh, maybe just try removing his um, headphones if he's using um, maybe the microphone and the headphones are not working. Um, and then just using his device to speak from, from which to speak from. Um, I would I would recommend that. So if you can maybe just try um, logging out and then logging in again. Okay, it's logged out. I'm just waiting for him to log back in. Okay, he hasn't tried to log back in yet. Um, Advocate Van der we seem to have lost him. Um, he hasn't come back in yet. Um, okay, I'm going to try and see if we can get hold of him in another way, my dear. Oops, let me put myself on mute and talking. I apologize to members. Um, I see he's now just back in the in the waiting room. Um, hopefully we will be able to hear him now. Cardi, can can you you are muted at the moment? Can you unmute yourself, and then we can just test if we can hear you. Yes, you're unmuted. Please speak now. Um, we are still not able to hear you. Um, are you using a are you using earphones? Perhaps you can remove your earphones. We are still not be able to hear you. Um, um, Advocate Van der Medipa, um, maybe um, I can ask um, IT to, to assist him. I don't know how he's going, yes. they're going to assist him, though, because, I mean, ultimately, it's still going to come down to his device, um, which mm. they will obviously not have any control over. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Chair, maybe um, we be guided by you, Chairperson. Maybe we can move on to... Can I use a phone? Yes, I mean, um, obviously, you. Um, I see there's a message from um, Cardi saying, can I Cardi. use a phone? Yes, he's able to use a phone. The most important thing that we need to do is we need to be able to hear him. 
Um, so if you can maybe log in with his phone, we can try that. Maybe we can uh, engage with the uh, Professor Dean's uh, uh, presentation in the meantime while he's still sorting himself out. I don't know if that will uh, assist. Thank you, Chair. Let me then maybe hand back to you for, for questions on, on the, the current presentation. I agree with you. It will help because we now need to quickly sort out some technology. And once we've sorted that out, um, you know, not to waste time. I think maybe if I can hand to you for, for, for some discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, honorable members, we've just uh, received the, the presentation um, from uh, Professor Dean. Um, it's time now for members to engage with the uh, presentation. If there are any questions of clarity, uh, you are free to, to, to do so. Now let's see if uh, there are hands. Uh, Maybe my dear can also help me with if there are any hands. Um, I don't see any hands, Chairperson. Oh, I see Honorable Mema. Oh, okay. Uh, you can go ahead, uh, Honorable Mema. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Let me... I'm welcoming the, the presentation uh, from uh, uh, from Professor Dean. Uh, there's, there's an aspect that Professor Dean raised at the, at the end of uh, his uh, his presentation uh, that uh, uh, that there has been. Uh, uh, an absence of litigation on the mm. uh, implementation of this of this act, despite the fact that it has been uh, uh, in uh, operation for the last fifty years. I think that's that's that, that's what that's what uh, uh, the professor has indicated, uh, uh, and he alluded to the fact that probably it could be the the maybe probably lack of awareness in terms of. Uh, the uh, importance of this uh, of this legislation. What, what I want to find out from the prof, from, from prof is uh, just in terms of uh, the uh, implementation of this act, or just an observation, uh, given the fact that I believe the rationale behind behind this uh, uh, bill is to close a, a particular lacuna uh, that uh, that has been identified uh, with regard to particularly the the, uh, the those that are on the receiving end the vulnerable uh, musician and performers just in terms of his uh, assessment uh, is there any observation that you could uh, that you could uh, Put forward in terms of uh, uh, the difficulties uh, with regard to the the uh, uh, the gap in the in the performance in the performance rights, particularly a lack of protection of the of the intellectual property rights of the of the of, of the performers, particularly those from the historically disadvantaged groups. I think there would definitely have been. Uh, 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 key players, what I would call them, color records or uh, other records that uh, that might be dominant uh, in the in, in, in the field of performance. Uh, whether is there any observation that you could uh, narrate uh, that will make us much more uh, 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 key in terms of I mean uh, understanding. Uh, the, the rationale behind this bill being referred back to parliament, are there any uh, uh, contentious issues uh, in relation to what is happening nationally or internationally that could have led to, the, to, the, to, 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 to this bill being sent back? And uh, if, that is the, if, if there is such an observation, 
uh, or a sense in terms of the the, the, the referral. Uh, uh, it, it, could the referral uh, be as a result of strong lobbying by, uh, uh, by, by strong interest groups as opposed to the vulnerable groups uh, in, in, in relation to the, to, to, to the industry? Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, before the uh, uh, professor responds, um, uh, I want to check if uh, uh, CIPC, because it is indicating that he has uh, connected using his phone. I would suggest that we hear from him first and uh, ask uh, the professor to note your question. Uh, but also, Honorable Mimam, we had uh, advised the panelists uh, not uh, to comment on the merits and demerits of uh, the, the two bills. Uh, they, they, they should just focus on the law um, not not uh, the the amendments of the bills, um, so so perhaps he, he, he can just uh, uh, respond on the why there has only been a, a one case. Uh, perhaps if I may add, uh, what is the role of uh, the collecting uh, uh, management organization? No, collective is a, a society. Uh, is in it there to pass to the, the uh, uh, whether there are any infringements? Uh, or now, let, let's first check if uh, uh, the CIPC is ready to make the presentation. Uh, I see there's uh, some feedback, maybe it's uh, from their side. Uh, over to you, uh, CIPC. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. I apologize. It seems as if my mic is not Which one of the devices? It seems like you have two devices that are open, so you must switch one so that there is no feedback. Switch okay. off one, yes. Thank you, okay, thank you, you very much. Continue. Yes, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good morning, Chairperson and honorable members of the select committee. Advocate van der Merwe, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, let me also acknowledge the presence of my principals from the DTIC under the leadership of Dr. Evelyn Masoja, who are also present on the platform. Uh, again, we are honored to present here as CIPC uh, in this important workshop that is aimed at assisting the select committee members to deliberate on the two bills that are before them. Chair and honorable members, let me just mention at the outset that duplications and repetitions from my presentation and the presentation from Dr. Dean are inevitable as we all prepared our presentation from the same legislation being the Performance Protection Act. But I'm the, of the view that the two prepared presentations can coexist and still be useful to the honorable members in terms of assisting them to understand these rights that belong to the performers. So in my presentation, I will not pronounce or deal with the Performance Protection Bill at all but I will deal with the Performance Protection Act in its current form. So Chairperson, if for whatever reason I happen to enter into the Performance Protection Bill, please pardon me, it will be unintentional. The idea is not to go there. So having observed all protocol, Chair, let me go straight to my presentation, which I guess uh, can be screened. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So yeah, we can just go into the next slide. Chair, in this slide, I've just selected the topics which I think are relevant for me to engage honorable members on the protection, uh, Performance Protection Act. 
So because I don't have much time, let me not uh, go to them individually in this slide. I will deal with them when I get to their slides. So we can go to another slide. So, Chairperson, let me just, um, because I'm using a phone, I'm trying to, seems as if I lost some slides. I got them. So, let me just, mention that South African Copyright Act, it's a primary legislation in the copyright system. And it is our national law. And it has been enacted in compliance with the Ben Convention, uh, which I always call it the mother of all the conventions in the copyright field. So we can safely say our Copyright Act is compliant with Ben Convention and South Africa is a signatory to Ben. So being a signatory to Ben, we are able to get the benefits that Ben Convention members do have for their nationals. Now, a workshop has already taken place on a copyright, but it suffices here just to mention that Copyright Act, it is that national law that lists all the categories of works that enjoy copyright. And it also lists the requirements that should be met to attain copyright protection for such works. So in comparison, to Performance Protection Act. I'll, all, I've always viewed Performance Protection Act as a secondary legislation. It is still our national law, but I have always thought and regarded it as a secondary legislation because even the rights that it grants are related rights, are neighboring rights. It remains our national law and it is in compliance with Wipe Room Convention, which was enacted or concluded in 1961. And we can safely say to a certain extent, our Performance Protection Act complies with Wipe of Onograms and Performance Treaty, which was concluded in 1996. Uh, I'm saying so because in 2002, when we introduced collective management of rights in sound recording, section five, subsection one of the Performance Protection Act was amended so that it can accommodate performers in this collective management of rights in sound recording. Currently, CIPC is the regulator in this collective management of rights in sound recording. So our act, was amended so that the performers become the beneficiaries of the collective management rights in sound recording as well. Now, just to be specific, Performance Protection Act is a piece of legislation that is aimed at performers. It recognizes their performance and it grants them the rights over those performances. In the same manner as Copyright Act will give rights to creators of copyright works, such as books, films, et cetera. So Performance Protection Act specifically grants the performers for their performances. Let me also mention that performances are a product of creativity. In the same manner as copyright works, are a product of creativity. But we see performance being a display of talent when a singer is singing 
when an actor is acting or casting his or her role in a film. So performance is more of displaying that talent. That is why when film producers, when they have a script before them, they will always search for a talent that can talk to that script. They will therefore search for a performer who has the talent that can match that script. And that's where we see talent being displayed. Second, I mean, next uh, slide. Now, let me again compare copyright with performance. In your workshop, I understand you were told what copyright means. It's a type of intellectual property that grants the author the exclusive right to do certain things, which we call them restricted acts for a limited period of time. Sometimes those restricted acts are called monopoly because these are the do's and the don'ts. But when we compare it with performance, performance simply means delivering and acting and giving rendition of a work. For a performance to be recognized in law as a right, it must be performing certain works. And in this case, it could be musical compositions or lyrics or following a script in a film. But a performer must perform some works, which we find them in copyright. So to identify those works that can be performed by a performer, we therefore look at literary works, which very often will then produce a film script. A performer, in order for her or him to enjoy performance, I mean protection for his or her performance, must be able to perform either literary work or musical works. When a performance is performed on a film script and fixated, it will then be found being condensed in a cinematograph film. It appears here in a fixated form. The same happens when a performer has performed musical compositions. If they are fixated or recorded, then we will find them in sound recording. So only literary works and musical works can be performed. And when they are fixated, we will see them in a sound recording or we will see them in a cinematograph films. Next slide. So here is just a singer performing the musical works. And this is performance because she is performing musical works. Next slide. Here is a performer or performers performing a script in a film, whether fixated or unfixated, they are performing a work and that work is literary work. Therefore their performance is protected in law. Next slide. Now, because these are rights, they give a performer certain privileges. We call them monopoly or restricted acts. In other words, the section five of the Performance Protection Act provides that no person shall, without the consent of the performer broadcast, or communicate to the public and fixed performance of such a performer. Section five, subsection one of the Performance Protection Act is very important because it spells out 
these restricted acts. And it requires any person who wants to use that performance to get a consent from a performer. So a performer will enjoy the right to prevent others from making a fixation of the unfixed performance. Again, performer enjoys a right to prevent other people from making a reproduction of his or her performance. So section five is very, very, very important. In my view is the nucleus of the Performance Protection Act because these are the rights of performers and they are exercised by these performers to ensure that they enjoy monopoly over their performances. Uh, performances like copyright works, they can still be used without the consent of a performer, provided that uh, they are used under the exceptions. And those exceptions are the same exceptions that we find in the Copyright Act. And when we, you were workshopped, I believe you were taken through exceptions. Exceptions are necessary so that the works can be used in the interest of the public. Next slide. In simple terms, just to give honorable members a simple understanding of these rights that we're dealing with. Performers are simply actors in films or audiovisual work. I will use film or audiovisual work interchangeably. In South Africa, our current acts, they employ the term film, but we have seen other jurisdictions having migrated to a new term of audiovisual work for a film. So actors are simple, uh, Performers are simply actors and singers, either in audiovisual work or in music sound recordings. I've indicated that singing and acting constitute performances and are protected in law. So in explaining performance, we can simply say these are related rights or neighboring rights. They are neighboring rights or related rights because they come from a secondary legislation. But we should not understand these rights to be inferior to the rights that are found in the Copyright Act over copyright works. They are rights in law. They enjoy same legal recognition in law. We have seen these rights being made inferior in the industry, but it shouldn't be. Maybe this is only because of economic systematic challenges and imbalances in the commercial market that subject this rise of the performers to be inferior when they are negotiating commercial deals they shouldn't be inferior because they are rights. They can dictate who they want um, to fixate their performances. They can decide who to consent to in terms of their performances being reproduced. So they can exercise these rights successfully. We have seen in other jurisdictions where performers have formed unions. And those unions, they advocate the rights of the performers. And they even have terms, standardized terms and conditions for engagement when performances are going to be used in the commercial market. But South Africa does not have that kind of a model. We have seen performers 
continue to contract individually over their performances, whether in film or during the recording of their performances in sound recordings. So South African actors are still contracting individually and their contracts will always differ from one performer to another. Next slide. So in this slide, I'm just showing honorable members how this multiple rise can be compressed in one product. Even if they are compressed in one product, we should have the technical know-how of tracing them separately to ensure that they still enjoy their separate existence and recognition. For example, we know that in a, a film, the role players there will be the script writer. You will then have an actor who will then give a performance in that film. Then you will have the name of the movie, which could be a trademark. And then recently, we have seen sound recording being incorporated in films as a soundtrack. So these are the role players, each and every one, they enjoy their separate rights. Now, because they commercialize their performances, they commercialize their works, we now see the law of contract playing a very important role to make sure that these rights attract that commercial gain. Obviously, a film producer will then approach a script writer, either license or buy that script. Sometimes, if the script writer is well educated with IP, that script writer will uh, opt for joint ownership. But what we have seen, and in our engagement with script writers, performers, script writers often license or sell their script to film producers. Honorable members must also understand that when a performer consent for his or her performance to be fixated, there is a deeming provision which I will explain in the slides to come to say, once a performer consent to that, he's also consenting to the producer being the person who's going to commercialize the work that contains or features his or her performance. So honorable members must understand that deeming provision. Next slide. The same principle applies here. They are role players in a sound recording. Musical compositions have their own copyright. A trademark could be the name or, of the song or the track. And a performance will always be there so that a performer can display that talent. And that talent very often is the one that attracts that sound recording. I have observed in life, especially people who are fanatics of music, they will always associate each and every sound recording with a performer rather than a record producer. It's simply because they enjoy the talent that comes out of that scene. So performance play a very important role in making a sound recording to attract uh, commercial gains in the market. Again, the same um, law of contract will then be used uh, so that the sound 
recording producer can decide whether to get a license from music composer or buy the musical composition that is going to be part of the sound recording. Uh, but when we engage in the industry, uh, music composers are often licensing. Uh, we are yet to see some deals that um, that are on joint ownership between music composer and owners of sound recordings. If they do exist, they should be in small numbers. But the law of contract will always be used uh, to do those deals. Next slide. So we, we have seen in the industry the law of contract playing an important role to, to the extent where a performer and a producer of sound recordings will conclude recording deals. And in concluding, in, in concluding those recording deals, we have seen contractual arrangements uh, promoting or being based on advanced payments to the performers by record companies. A record company will be for the commercialization of the sound recording that features performance and agree with a performer to say, I'm giving you so much and, and this is not just a free money. I'm going to recoup it when I start to commercialize the sound recording. And until I have recouped what I've given you, I will not be giving you any money other than the advance that I've given you. So we have seen those advanced payment models being on the rise in the music industry. But I must emphasize here again that performers, they do have rights and they, they can exercise those rights in a manner that commercially benefit them. But as I've said, due to systematic challenges in the music industry, we have seen this advanced payment model being perpetuated. So this law of contracts allows these rights to exchange hands uh, in anticipation of commercial gain. And the law of contract or the freedom to contract forms a cornerstone of any intellectual property system because these rights, if they are not exchanging hands, they will never attract any commercial gains or benefit for the right holders. So the law of contract continues to be a catalyst in any intellectual property system. Next slide. Now, I have taken the members through the Performance Protection Act in so far as the rights of the performers are concerned. Let me now link the performers' rights with international treaties because these rights of the performers are also internationally recognized and they are recognized in various treaties. I've just selected the treaties that give rise to the performers on an international plane. The first treaty that is also relevant in terms of granting the performers the rights is the Rome Convention of 1961. Rome Convention deals with three categories of right holders. It grants rights to the performers. It also grants rights to producers of phonograms, which is the, your record companies. Then it goes further to give rights to broadcasting organizations such as um, our SAPC, 
and uh, multi-choice. Previous slide. So Rome Convention deals with those three categories of right holders. But it's important to note that the performance rights were recognized as, as early as 1961. And our Performance Protection Act was a response to the Rome Convention. As a country, we responded to this international legal instrument and enacted our own national law, which also gave the performance the rise over their performances. If you can read our Performance Protection Act, it does mention the Rome Convention. Now, another treaty that is also relevant in terms of recognizing and giving the performers the rights over their performances is the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty, which was completed in 1996. This treaty is sometimes called Internet Treaty together with the WIPO Copyright Treaty. They call them Internet Treaty simply because they were responding to technological evolution that uh, invaded the creative industries across all the jurisdictions in the world. It was necessary for these rights to first be recognized at international level so that member states of WIPO can go to their national sphere and jurisdictions and craft a legislation that can also respond to this treaty. South Africa is not a member of Rome Convention. South Africa is not a member of WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty. But I must just mention that insofar as WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty, our Copyright Act together with Performance Protection Act were amended in 2006 to reflect or to include collective management of rights. And it took the provisions of this treaty. Section five, subsection one of the Performance Protection Act was amended so that the performance becomes part of that collective management right system, which comes from the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty. Copyright Act was amended. Uh, we amended Section 9 as a country. We also inserted Section 9A, which prescribed how this collective management of rights and sound recording will be implemented. Another treaty that is also very important is the Beijing Treaty on the Protection of Audiovisual Performances, which was concluded in 2012. I was fortunate to be part of this diplomatic uh, conference in Beijing. And it was clear during that diplomatic conference that many member states sympathized with the actors. And they were unanimous in terms of saying, let us recognize them internationally so that when we go home in our national sphere, we can then legislate national laws, which will then respond to the Beijing Treaty on the protection of audiovisual performances. As a country, we have not yet joined this treaty but it's an important treaty for the actors because it even protects their performances when they are consumed on digital markets. So this treaty in my view is also an internet treaty because it responded to technological evolution for the digital markets. These treaties, in my view, uh, recognized on international play the talent that we find in performances. 
Cardi, sorry to interrupt. Um, your time is up. So if you can wrap up, I note that you're quite close to the end, but if you can maybe just speed up a little bit and, and then try and get through your slides. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. So, honorable members, these are just the rights that comes from these three treaties. They are all aimed at benefiting the performers when their performances are consumed on digital market or even when they are communicated to the public. So you can go through those um, rights. They are very clear. They relate to reproduction, distribution, rental, making available and broadcasting and communication to the public. Next slide. Um, the duration of protection for performance in South Africa is 50 years from the day on which the performance took place and if it's fixated from the day on which it was recorded. Other jurisdictions have a longer duration of performance protection. Next slide. Exceptions on the use of performance. The same exceptions that are used in the Copyright Act are also applicable for performances. Performances can be used for purpose of criticism or review or reporting of current events, for teaching or scientific research, and also for legal proceedings in the interest of the public. Next slide. Offenses and liabilities in the same manner as they were presented by OND. They are the same when it comes to performances. We have criminal sanctions. We also have civil liabilities. But let me just also mention that in 2010, a collecting society by the name of SAMRO interdicted SAMPRA, which was a collecting society for owners of sound recording. The reason why they interdicted them is they formulated a distribution plan without their involvement. My point here is to emphasize that the rights of performers are rights in law and they can be enforced. They should not be understood to be inferior to other rights that are found in copyright. What Sampra did, they successfully interdicted Sampra from distributing those royalties on the basis that they were not consulted or they were not involved in that formulation of the distribution plan, whereas they have a material interest in that distribution. Their material interest is simply because those sound recordings feature their performances and they have rights to those performances. And that's my emphasis. Next slide. So honorable members, chairperson, I think this little presentation should be able to assist you as you'll be deliberating on these two bills that are before you. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kari. I'm glad that we could sort your technology challenges out in the end because that was a quite an interesting um, presentation. Chair, if I may then hand back to you for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate, and uh, also thanks to Mr. Pritchard uh, for the presentation. Uh, I thought that it was important that uh, we start with the presentation uh, before the question, because the question may be uh, seem 
Mila for both uh, presentations. Um, so there was uh, already a question. I I hope that uh, uh, Mr. Pedro Ojo had the uh, the the question from uh, Honorable Moimank um, that arose from the input of uh, Professor uh, Dean uh, with regard to why only one case uh, so far uh, 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 he's aware of. Um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 maybe you can also come in uh, uh, in terms of responding to that question. Um, I don't know if uh, honorable members, there are any other questions, uh, even from members uh, from the uh, portfolio committees from the provinces. Uh, I see the hand of uh, honorable Moimang uh, up in. I will encourage uh, uh, members from the uh, provincial legislators, uh, they are free also to ask questions if uh, they have any. Honorable Moima, Ma- 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 we can come in again. Thank you, thank, 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 thank you, Chair. Uh, I think let me uh, uh, appreciate the, the second uh, presenter uh, for uh, the uh, uh, presentation made. Chair, the the distinction made by uh, the picture on uh, on the uh, primacy uh, of the copyright vis-à-vis the the second secondary nature of the of the performance performance uh, uh, act. Uh, is the distinction itself uh, not uh, not problematic uh, in the sense that one uh, should uh, start from the basis that uh, all legislation are, are, are primary and uh, the uh, we have drawn a distinction between a regulation and a, a policy and a, and a legislation. And uh, by so doing, uh, is that in itself not uh, not uh, elevating the copyright uh, above uh, the performance? You know, the Copyright Act uh, above the uh, performance uh, uh, act. The, the the second point, the <clears throat> the the competing rights, the competing rights. Uh, 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 between 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 various role players, whether it's the scriptwriter, whether it's the producer, whether it's the performer, is, is there is there no way uh, in which uh, uh, the the role players could be much more elaborated, uh, such that. Uh, uh, we are then able to mitigate the impact of the law of contract uh, in uh, into a larger extent uh, disadvantaging other role players. Uh, the, the, the reason why I'm raising this point is, is by virtue of the fact that uh, he did make reference to, to the systemic nature of challenges that sometimes are found in this industry. Uh, which, uh, to a larger extent, uh, a performer, uh, a, a performer, then as a result of the of the uh, example that he alluded to around the advance payment by the by the uh, by the uh, uh, recording labels uh, uh, and the performer uh, uh, coming into into an agreement that. Uh, until uh, recouping this particular amount, there shall be no payment, which uh, to another extent uh, has, has led to the situation that I believe the, the, uh, these two acts are, are, are geared towards addressing. But it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just the, uh, an emphasis on the point that he raised. There are systemic problems that uh, to another extent uh, 
you then found FIFA and distribution where the law of contract trumps over the rights of the performers as protected by the legislation. Is there no way, is there no way in which this matter can be can be can be can be dealt with? Uh, raising this point precisely by virtue of the fact that the only contracts that, 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 that are vulnerable to attack, the only contracts that can be set aside, the only contracts that, uh, that are available in nature. Uh, uh, what is it that we need to do to make sure that uh, uh, legislation remains primacy? And even though the law of contract is at the center of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, 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 of what has been happening, we are then able to, able to use the legislation to sort of close those gaps that the law of contract seems to be uh, exploiting. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Moima. Uh, there any other questions, uh, Honorable Members? Seems uh, none. Uh, can, I, can I just check maybe from the committee secretary first? I noticed that after uh, Professor D uh, Dean uh, finished uh, uh, his input, then we got this thing that says uh, uh, proceedings are recorded. What was was it a mistake not to call, call, uh, record them earlier or there was no consent uh, for, uh, given by uh, Professor Dean? Can I no, just no, it was, no, it was, a, was it? it was a mistake on our side, Chi. It was a mistake oh, on our okay. side, but we will endeavor to um, ensure that we do get the recordings as well. Oh, okay. No, because he was saying uh, when he was delivering the input that he was performing and uh, that uh, his performance was then protected. So I thought that maybe he has not uh, given uh, the consent. Uh, but also maybe linked to that, uh, now because this uh, 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 workshop is being uh, uh, broadcast as we speak on YouTube and uh, uh, Twitter, I, uh, what does it mean then in terms of the consent? Uh, uh, and uh, with regard to infringement, uh, yeah, if uh, you could uh, clarify that as well. Um, but also on the disposition of uh, the performer's right, how would you know if uh, a person is not being, uh, I mean, pushed uh, to assign instead of uh, giving license? Uh, what what protection around that uh, can be guaranteed that a person is not being perhaps intimidated to 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 assign uh, instead of uh, just uh, giving a license? Um, I mean the example that we're making about the ownership of a house and leasing of the house. <laughs> How would you know if this person is forced to sell the house instead of leasing it? Yeah, uh, if we can get uh, responses, uh, perhaps both of you yeah, can come in terms of responses, uh, maybe from different angles. Uh, we, over, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Professor D. Can you please unmute yourself? Uh, you are muted. Yes, you, you can. You can go ahead. Yeah, I just um, to begin with, like to just pick up on a couple of points you yourself made, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, firstly, the question of proceedings are recorded. Um, I have no problem with that, and um, I, I guess that what happened was that someone suddenly tumbled to the idea that you actually, as a uh, an organization that is busy making a recording needed such a, uh, con uh, a, a, a permission in terms of the Performance Protection Act. So whoever put up that notice was just being mindful of what was required under the Performance Protection Act. But another factor which should come into play is the whole question of, of implied licenses. I mean, take my position. I I'm aware that I was told in advance that uh, these um, uh, the session would be recorded and, and broadcast as well. Now, if I go into, I was never asked whether I consented, but if I go into 
uh, an arrangement like that, knowing that it is going to be broadcast and recorded, then I'm in giving an implied license and implied consent to, to, to that happening anyway. So implied licenses can play a very big role in, in intellectual property. The second point is um, uh, you've mentioned um, performers being pushed to, that's the term you used, to assign their rights. Well, in fact, they cannot assign their rights. As I mentioned when uh, I was doing my presentation, for some reason in the Performance Protection Act, there is no facility for a performer to assign his rights. And perhaps that was done deliberately to, to avoid performers being placed in a situation where they could be pushed into, into transferring their rights. So that, that, that particular problem ought not to arise, not with performers anyway, it can happen with, uh, in, in copyright. Um, right, to begin, now let's start at the beginning. Uh, the Honorable Moema raised a number of different um, uh, issues. Um, the question of why so few cases, um, I actually don't know. I mean, the Performers Protection Act is, is used almost on a daily basis when uh, permissions are given and uh, contracts are entered into to, uh, to, to give permission. So it's not as if the act is not being used. But what is clearly not happening is that performers are not taking action to enforce their rights in the court. Now, um, let me just draw a comparison with the copyright situation. Um, when I did my doctorate uh, and I produced my um, textbook, which was in the late 1980s, I made this, uh, I, I con conducted considerable research and, I, and I, my objective was to locate every single South African copyright case which had taken place prior to, to that date, let's say 1986. Now, copyright has been operating in South Africa since the 1800s for the best part of 200 years. I could only find 17 cases. So in the 200 years, starting in 1800 through to the late 1980s, there were only 17 copyright cases in, in, in South Africa. I then produced my textbook, which was essentially the, the first textbook on copyright <clears throat> law. And it... I think opened people's eyes as to what possibilities um, copyright presented in order to um, uh, use economic situations and, and, and benefit themselves. And what happened was that immediately there was a flare up in, the, in, 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 in copyright cases. And as was said in my um, introduction or the, uh, the in, in, in introduction given in respect of me, I personally have acted in 50, over 50 copyright infringement cases in the last 30 years. There have probably been maybe 75 South African cases in the last 30 years. So for 200 years, there were 17 cases. In the next 35, next, next 30 odd years, there were 75 cases. And I attribute that to the fact that people became aware of copyright. That lawyers started finding out about copyright. They started realizing what it could do for their clients if they exercise their rights under copyright. Now, there has been very little writing about um, performance protection. I included a chapter of perform on performance protection in my textbook, and in fact, it is the the, the printed um, document which which I, I provided for circulation. That is really the only writing that has been done in in terms of performance protection. It's an area of the law that nobody knows anything about, and and I attribute. If you're asking me for a reason why there's only been one case, it's because people don't know about the law and they don't know what rights it, it offers them, what opportunities it offers them. So that's my, my sort of off the cuff uh, view as to why there's been so few little activity. Um, the question of um, performance protection being secondary rights or in some way inferior rights, um, they are not. They are self-standing. They have exactly the same status as copyright or any other intellectual property rights. I think why it might have um, come about to some extent is that the Berne Convention dates from um, the 1800s. 
Um, at that stage, no one had ever thought of performance protection. Uh, sound recordings were just about non-existent. Even, even um, broadcasting was just about non-existent. So the Berne Convention only dealt with literary music, artistic uh, works, and cinematograph films. As the years progressed, it became the realization dawned that intellectual property needed to cover other kinds of works as well. And so a sort of a, a supplement was brought out, considered for the Berne Convention, and they, which then extended to cover um, sound recordings uh, and the other types of rights, including performance protection rights. And they were referred to as neighboring rights neighboring in the sense that they weren't included in the Berne Convention, not neighboring because they were in any way inferior, but they weren't included in the Berne Convention, and they've never been included in the Berne Convention. So that's why they're considered to be somewhat separate and apart from the, let's call it the primary rights. There's, there's no suggestion that they are in any way inferior. Uh, How to manage competing rights. Um, I, I think it's wrong to um, consider that the law of contract is some sort of bad guy that is um, having a malevolent influence on, on, on the exercise of intellectual property rights. That is, that is not so at all. Where the law of contract comes into play is the question of giving permission. Um, the Copyright Act and the Performance Protection Act give restricted acts. And uh, if third parties want to exercise these restricted acts, they have to get permission. And that is done in a contract. So that's, that's the significance of contracts. The contracts govern the manner in which the, the um, uh, monopolistic rights are exercised by third parties. Now, South Africa prides itself, and our courts repeatedly say this, and, 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 and um, it's been mentioned in today that um, there is a basic principle of freedom of contract. People should be free to set to ag agree their relationships how they want to agree their relationships. Bargaining positions come into play. Uh, if you are a, a, a well-known author um, and uh, you, uh, you want to, to publish a book, you can dictate your terms to, to your publisher. There may be publishers who are queuing up to want to publish your book. So you can you, you the, are in the strong bargaining position. If you're a first-time author, you never published a book in your life before, you're trying to beg a, a, a publisher to publish your, your book, the publisher is in the strong bargaining position. You're going to get a worse deal uh, in your contract than will happen in the case where you are a well-known author. And that's a fact of economic life. I mean, the, the um, uh, intellectual property uh, complies with the normal um, uh, economic principles of, of, of supply and demand and market preferences and, and all that sort of thing. Unfortunately, performers, probably because they've been to some extent, uh, some extent um, uh, ignorant of, of their rights, have not been assertive in coming forward with, with um, stating their terms. I mean, there are enough performers in South Africa who are well known, very famous, and could, are in a position to dictate to record companies and broadcasters and so forth um, what the terms of the arrangement should be. Um, talking about how the, um, the remuneration is provided and um, the question of a, of, a, of, a, of a lump sum payment, uh, that is one of the ways in which um, remuneration can be given to a rights owner for the use of his rights, whether he's a performer or a, um, a copyright owner. Same <laughs> principle applies. Um, it's not an evil thing, an upfront payment. Uh, let me tell you, I published a, um, a book um, about 10 years ago um, where the publisher approached me and said, we would like you to write this book and uh, we prepared to give you a 10,000 Rand upfront um, payment. Uh, and thereafter, no royalties. Um, I chose to go with that arrangement because I thought it would be beneficial to me because what it, the value of it is that the book might never sell a single copy, but you still get your 10,000 Rand. Uh, the alternative is to say, well, I want two Rand for every copy that is sold. And uh, if only 
100 copies are sold, you end up, end up earning next to nothing. So you've got to, this comes back to the question of freedom of contract. You've got to suss out the, the commercial opportunities of your work when you agree to the form of, of, uh, of remuneration. I mean, there are various possibilities. You can take the upfront payment and get no royalties. You can get only royalties based on sales down the line with, with no upfront payment, or you can get a combination of the two. And uh, you as the rights holder have got to weigh up which is going to be better for you. And uh, so there's nothing evil about um, offering a, uh, an upfront payment. Uh, as I said, it gives you certainty. It's the, the situation of the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Uh, if you get an upfront payment, at least you know you're going to get something. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't poo poo the upfront payment as 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 being a worthwhile uh, way of getting remuneration. Um, how to manage competing rights is a, is is a very difficult situation. Um, as I mentioned, if if um, if I do I'm a singer, I do a, a music video. I'm giving a performance of a musical work, the melody under copyright. I'm giving a performance of the lyrics, a literary work under copyright. Um, I go to the record company. Um, I grant the record company the, the right to record my performance and also the right to, to, to record, to, to make a reproduction of the literary work and the, and the uh, art, artistic work. The record company goes to the broadcaster and says to the broadcaster, you want to use my record to do a broadcast, that's fine. But you've got all of these different rights holders involved and they're all entitled to some form of remuneration. Now, how you manage all of that, how the broadcaster pays the record company, how the record company pays the performer and how the performer pays the um, literary copyright owner and the musical copyright owner is a very complex setup. And um, it, it, one has to approach it in a very scientific and, and analytic way. Um, and so it's, it, it helps to have um, uh, collecting societies, for instance, where um, uh, a body can negotiate on behalf of, of, of a variety of different rights holders. But however you, you look at it, it remains a very complicated process. And it's all regulated by the law of contract. Because each of those permissions that have to be obtained are, are, are obtained have to be contained in a contract. Um, so one has to you, you can't take a, a superficial view of all of this. You have to really sit down and, and analyze what exactly is happening, who's doing what, and who's entitled to what, and then try and put it all together in a uh, in an omelet. Uh, and it's, a, believe me, a very difficult process. And, and, and lawyers who do this sort of thing have to be very skilled in what they're doing. That's all I have. To, well, just a couple of points arising from um, Icardi's um, uh, presentation, if I may. Um, he, he placed the emphasis on... Um, Performances in in films and, and 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 records, which which is not wrong because that's probably the main area in which um, performers' rights come into um, into contention. But you must realize um, that it, it's not only those kind of performers that are involved. It's it's performances of all kinds of works. I, I read out to you, and I'll just repeat it: um, what the law has to say. The performances protected by the act are those of actors, singers, musicians, dancers, and other persons who act, sing, deliver, declaim, play, or otherwise perform literary music, dramatic, dramatic and music, artistic works, expressions of folklore. So when a poet stands up and, and reads a poem, he's giving a performance. I mentioned that what I'm doing here and now is giving a performance. So the law has to cater for all of these kinds of performances, not only for um, singers and, and, and actors. Uh, as I said, they are the, probably the most prominent kind of performers, but they're not the only performers. And the law has to 
can't focus only on those people. It has to focus uh, on performance across the board. I think that's enough for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's give over to uh, Mr. Peche. Any thank comments you. Thank from your side? Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'll try to give a sort of an, an umbrella view on the things that have been raised. I think the first point is to say intellectual property with copyright system being part of it. Uh, it's a foreign system to the African continent. And it's not amazing that um, it started as early as 1886 through the Penn Convention. So when it is introduced to some of the regions across the globe, uh, there are a lot of things that are dependent on that system to work properly. When I look at the entire copyright ecosystem, I don't think there is one institution or department that can really solve these issues. But we need a contribution from all the role players in the ecosystem, uh, have an integ integrated approach. Uh, one of the, the, the reasons for that is maybe Maybe the, the market forces um, might dictate something that is quite opposite to what we want in our law, in the sense that these rights are private rights in nature. And I do not envisage or foresee any situation whereby each and every right holder, when he's making a deal, somebody can just be there to assist. It is not possible. These rights must be um, managed privately by the right holders. And the only thing that is required in my view is this continuous education and awareness on these rights so that they can understand uh, how best to approach some of the deals. But at the same time, it's very difficult to also and pronounce uh, to say which deal is good, which deal is not good. So there are a lot of things that we need to take into consideration, which are not necessarily um, copyright issues. There are issues outside the copyright system as well. So that, that's one thing. I also agree with Dr. Dean that Performances should not only be limited to those that are fixated in sound recording and uh, films. They are also theatrical performances, which are also able to generate uh, revenue or royalties for, for the performers. I just took those because I thought um, they are often used and Every day we relate to them when we watch TVs, when we listen to music. But indeed, I agree that there are also other performances that um, are not necessarily in film and sound recording. Um, as a copyright office, time and again, we advise right holders to go for a licensee rather than selling of the intellectual property right itself, especially uh, for those who have produced copyright works because you can sell them right away. The reason for that is we believe that when it's licensed, um, after the expiry of a licensing period, uh, very often you will find that the work is now even more expensive than it has been. Or it also gives the right holder an opportunity to review the contract unlike where it has been sold. And at the later stage, it turns out that it's now uh, becoming even more commercially valuable 
that means its price might have increased. So we always advise for a licensing rather than outright selling. So, but still, it will be um, naive for us as a copyright office to say licensing is always better than outright selling because each and every case must depend on its own circumstances. There are those musicians these days who will produce these sound beats uh, in numbers and they sell them right away. They will tell you that this is what I want. I will produce other ones. And then they are able to make quick monies. And the question of contracts is very difficult again because when we engage the industry, the industry very often cautioned us to say, you must not um, uh, discourage the freedom to contract because these products, these works must be able to exchange hands, must be able to, to be licensed to the user so that they can attract those commercial gains. So if we're gonna discourage the freedom to contract in this space, it might stifle the system as a whole. So before we, we can say the contracts are not necessarily uh, benefiting certain category of right holders. I think the best way is to keep on educating the right holders about intellectual property, educating them about the, the, the options that they might have in terms of dealing with uh, this product that belongs to them. So yeah, some of the things are not necessarily um, challenges that resides in the copyright system, but it could be market, the behavior of the market uh, forces, the economic state of our country taking into account the historical issues. So the combination of that uh, really makes our 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 copyright system a little bit tricky, uh, and it's always difficult to advise in certain circumstances. Thank you, Chair. Mm, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Pitts. Chair, could I, I just, know, could I just come in and just? Um, comment on, on, on one of the statements that Cardi has made, which I support, and I, I want to support him in it. And that is that freedom of contract is very important because it, it, it allows nuanced approaches, which, as he says, um, can take account of changing circumstances, different circumstances, and particular circumstances. And I'm against any system which seeks to restrain or restrict freedom of contract, to impose a particular solution on, on, on rights holders, which says you have to assign the, the copyright or the, whatever the right it is, or you have to go for a license, which is a, a royalty payments over a period. That is actually taking away the rights of, of, of the rights owners, because it is saying to them, instead of having the full spectrum of, of um, possible ways of earning money we are requiring you to stick to one particular way of earning money and it may not be the best type of way of earning money in all circumstances it's it's you, you face this with a situation here where one one size does not fit all and and freedom of contract enables you to deal with that situation and i also want to support him on his view that education is so important uh, uh, I come back to the point that uh, I, I think that there's been very little um, enforcement activity in, um, in the field of performance contract because people are ignorant. They do not know what their rights are. And the only way in which people can get to know what their rights are is by way of education. And consequently, education is of the utmost importance. Thank you. We should conduct that education. Sorry? Is it the responsibility of department? To, well, I think the look the, the department. We should conduct uh, the education so that uh, performance. Mm. Chair, 
if I may. Um, yes. Obviously, the Copyright Office could be the leading organization, but we need to work with all role players in the ecosystem. Uh, for instance, um, you, you have other organizations such as National Video and Film Foundation that is responsible for funding of these film scripts from the inception. So you need to get all the role players so that each and every player can contribute uh, to the system of copyright in terms of education, their mandate. There's no super department or super organization that alone can fix any intellectual property system or copyright system. That is why in other countries, and South Africa does not have this, they have crafted what we call intellectual property strategy or copyright strategy, so that they will prescribe in that document where they want to focus on and who are the role players who should then uh, uh, deal with those issues. So it's very important that uh, as a country, we need to even go to a level where we gauge where we are strong, we gauge where we are, uh, are weak and start to focus on areas where we are very strong and assist these right holders to even commercialize their product outside our country so that they can repatriate those revenues that they get from other jurisdictions back to the country and do more job creation and grow our businesses. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, Honorable members, are there any uh, follow-up questions? Could I make a follow-up comment, if please? Um, when, when I started the Chair of Intellectual Property Law at Stellenbosch University, one of the objectives I set for the Chair and for myself was to do what I called popularizing intellectual property. And by that, I meant bringing it to, to the masses to, to um, let the world out there the property and, and, and what it can offer. And so we started a, for instance, a layman's course um, on intellectual property um, at the university, once a year, a, a, a workshop is held for a few days to which non-lawyers are invited or given the opportunity of, of coming so that they can learn something about um, intellectual property. We also started a blog um, which enabled people to write articles about intellectual property, but not, not articles aimed at lawyers or judges or academics, art, articles aimed at the man in the street. And um, although it's, it's, it's a small step, uh, it is a step in the direction of what I'm propagating, namely getting the world out there to know more about intellectual property. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, I see that there are no follow-up hands from members. I don't know if uh, there are any comments uh, from uh, uh, advocate uh, for an effort before we get to the next item. Thank you, Chair. I have no inputs. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, honorable members, uh, my observation, perhaps let, let, let's take this opportunity then to uh, first uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Dean and uh, Mr. Peche for the uh, sharing information on the performance protection. Um, uh, we we did receive the presentation, but it uh, it is very good when you take it through uh, uh, those presentations. So sometimes when you are all by yourself reading uh, uh, some, you don't know understand some of the concepts. Uh, but uh, when you are taken through uh, to the delivery, then of uh, the inputs, uh, the presentation, you get to uh, further understand the meaning of those concepts. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, because this will, as uh, you know, CIPC was indicating, that it's going to assist when we deal now with the actual uh, amendments uh, uh, bills uh, to the principal acts. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, you were last week, and you are here again uh, this week to uh, to assist us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, but also, 
we would encourage uh, provinces uh, if they would like also to have uh, workshops uh, they they could do so but but also they could uh, perhaps get copies uh, of uh, the zoom copies of uh, these proceedings uh, last week's uh, proceedings and uh, this week's proceedings uh, but also this uh, information are also I think stored in YouTube and the uh, uh, Twitter, uh, but also in the website of uh, Parliament, uh, those who are not here can a- be able to access uh, those proceedings uh, recorded uh, with the understanding that consent uh, has been granted uh, <laughs> to do so. Um, so. So that when you deal with your own processes in the provinces, it, uh, you, you also have an understanding of where um, these concepts when they were uh, uh, translated or interpreted uh, to us uh, as members. Uh, but also, the, I had ob- also observed last week uh, that uh, some uh, provincial uh, members had to join their plenary sessions. So they, mu- they must have missed out uh, in the afternoon when we're continuing uh, with the workshop. So that's why I would also uh, urge them maybe to uh, conduct the committee secretaries for the copies of uh, the Zoom or go to the YouTube or to the Twitter and they get the proceedings of uh, last week's uh, 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 cause it's going to assist them also when they deal with these processes uh, in terms of understanding the, 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 the concepts and also the context. Um, what uh, we want to suggest as well, in case uh, uh, provincial uh, delegates or uh, members from the legislatures uh, again uh, leave us and join their 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 plenary sessions, we would like to take uh, members and the uh, vote from the committee and the uh, legislature through the, the the legislative process that we'll be embarking upon. Uh, with regard to dealing with the two bills. Uh, But before that, I see the hand of the committee secretary. Yes, thank you, Chief Person. Um, Chief Person, I just wanted to indicate that um, following last week's meeting, we did circulate the presentations to the legislatures. Um, We've also sent them the the, the link to the recording as well. Um, So just to indicate that we have done so. All right. No, thank you so much. I think that uh, really helps uh, uh, because even some of us, uh, uh, myself included, uh, also want to utilize uh, also maybe this December period, uh, also to even go back to the to the link and uh, go through uh, the do- the documents that were circulated, uh, but also the the videos uh, of the presentation. Uh, of the panelists that we hear uh, uh, last week and, and also those that are uh, here so that as we interact uh, with the legislation, uh, you know, uh, I become aware of all these concepts and the context uh, because uh, when we engage then with the uh, 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 public uh, uh, submissions, um, that also is another process of education uh, will always uh, revert back uh, to the uh, inputs that we've received last week and also this week. I would encourage other members also to do the same, uh, both in the province and also uh, in the committee here national. Again, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, parting shots from your side and also uh, Mr. Pitch. Yes, I would like to just, um, am, I, am I mute or not? <laughs> yeah, no, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I would just like to, in a way, sympathize with, um, with your committee and, and with the provinces, because as you will have gathered from these workshops, uh, intellectual property law is a very complicated and, uh, and, and unknown area of the law. Um, it's very difficult for even lawyers to understand, let alone non-lawyers. The um, one judge once described it as a very technical subject. 
uh, by which he meant that you really, for someone coming in from the outside without knowing all the, the nuts and bolts, it becomes a very difficult subject matter to handle. Now, your legislators are faced with the problem where they are starting with a very complicated area of the law. And then they are being asked to look at amendments, uh, which are equally um, complex and, and, and difficult and come up with the right results in the end. And that is a very difficult task. And that is a task which I think um, is assisted by, by workshops such as these and getting input from people who, who know the subject matter because um, only in, in that way can you begin to do the job properly. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Petzer. Yeah, your departing shots. I don't know if he's still around. Uh, your parting shot, uh, Mr. Sepet. I don't think he's around there because maybe he was experiencing uh, challenges uh, with uh, his uh, device, maybe as a lock out. Okay, uh, on a remark, let, let let me ask then the. Uh, Enrico or committee secretary to flight uh, what I suggest because I'm fearing a situation where members uh, uh, from the legislatures won't be here this afternoon uh, so that uh, we, we take them through the process that we will be embarking uh, upon. Um, as a, yeah, the we last week and this week we've been dealing then with the workshop on the copyright amendment uh, bill, but not specifically the bill, uh, but the copyright law, and also the uh, performance protection law, uh, so that we understand the the concepts uh, and also the context. Um, what we plan then to do is that uh, between the first and the fifth uh, in terms of the cycle of uh, uh, dealing with section 76 bills, um, we plan to brief uh, provinces as uh, permanent delegates. Uh, we liaising with the PLOs uh, and the PLOs and the legislatures uh, should liaise with the departments uh, so that there the should be also briefing uh, in the in the provinces. So after we'll be uh, issuing out adverts uh, to newspapers and uh, radios uh, for for public comments. We expect that uh, we will then uh, receive uh, and the stakeholders. Um, the advert will then, from our side as a committee, uh, nationally will close on the 27th of uh, January, uh, 2023. Um, we will then, uh, on the 21st of February, have a, a, a public hearings, the 21st and also the 28th. Um, we'll continue with the public hearings and again on the 7th of March, uh, public hearings. Um, what we also requesting, uh, the, the reason why also we're putting this uh, so that uh, also the provinces uh, uh, take it to account is that uh, we also understand that uh, uh, provinces will also have their own programs. Uh, after they've received the briefings, uh, they will also advertise for the uh, public involvement uh, uh, after receiving the the inputs or submission from the public. Uh, they will also sit as a, a, a portfolio committees uh, to consider uh, the the submissions and then develop their negotiating mandates. Uh, we 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 are suggesting that uh, those. Uh, 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 meetings or the negotiating mandates must be sent to uh, to us uh, by by the ninth. So on the ninth, uh, the committee should be considering those negotiating mandates uh, from the provinces, and also on the sixteenth uh, of May. 
the reason we we're asking that because we, we will be having a, a, a public hearings as a committee and then we will consolidate uh, uh, the the position uh, in, uh, of uh, the committee uh, as a committee to consolidate that and then send uh, those to the provinces uh, so that as the provinces consider the negotiating mandate also they take into account what comes from the the committee uh, this our select committee uh, into account as they develop their negotiating mandates and then once that is then done we will then consider the negotiating mandates and then uh, make our views as a committee on the negotiating mandate send back uh, our views uh, which will also take into account the responses of uh, the department uh, on the on the on the negotiating mandates that will be coming from the provinces. Um, we we'll make that uh, available, including the minutes uh, of the committees. And uh, once that is then done, we will await then for the the final mandates uh, from the provinces that will go to the chairpersons. Uh, office the National Council of Provinces, um, and then we, we, we that those then will be giving us as a committee uh, the position. Given if uh, the five provinces who are in favour, then means uh, we'll go to the uh, uh, plenary session of the NCOP and the uh, and the uh, uh, table a report uh, and also indicate that. Uh, uh, so many provinces have voted in uh, four, uh, but also if uh, uh, there are fewer than uh, five, it would have mean that uh, uh, the bill or the bills have no uh, uh, support. Um, so that that would be process. But the one that we wanted to emphasize on is this one of uh, um, we know that this is a, a six year, a six month, I mean, a six week cycle. We will also be uh, writing to the chapters to plan extension because one other issue that we concern about is that so that's why we even will be having our adverts in january because some of some people may not take note if we have this uh uh, adverts in in December because uh, I mean December is a very busy month. So some people may complain that uh, we advertise on a wrong month, and then they uh, uh, did not focus. So that's why we we have it uh, in January. Uh, so the the emphasis on our part is that before you continue with the negotiating money, please wait for the the report that will be submitted to. Uh, provinces that take into account because some of uh, the stakeholders may not necessarily uh, um, make their submission in the provinces they will make their submission in the in, in, to the committee uh, nationally and we need to consider their submission and uh, also the responses of department and then develop a report that will then share <laughs> uh, with the provinces wanted to to indicate that before perhaps some of you then join the 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 plenary sessions uh, of your legislatures. I don't know if uh, there are any questions. It seems they're not. Uh, at this stage, then we, unless the committee secretary will advise, at this stage we'll uh, uh, adjourn uh, uh, for lunch, and then we will uh, resume, uh, I think we at half past, uh, one, uh, I don't have my program now because uh, I'm using the same screen uh, for Zoom. Um, we will then resume at half past uh, uh, one and then the department uh, will take us through the two brief, I mean, uh, two uh, appeals and then we allow members to ask uh, questions for clarity. And then once uh, that is all done, we will then invite uh, advocate uh, Fanemewe, uh, just a brief overview uh, on the uh, constitutional uh, court decision uh, on the issue of uh, the challenge uh, by the I think blind uh, South Africa uh, organization. Uh, that outcome, as I indicated earlier, that the, the detailed analysis uh, of such will then be dealt with 
put in other uh, meetings of uh, the committee. Any comments, uh, Secretary, uh, Advocate, before we adjourn? Um, no, thank you, uh, and thanks, Advocate Fund Member. So, okay, um, no comments, but just to say there was one item that we um, might have left off the legislative program, which was actually um, departmental responses to the issues raised in the public hearings, but we will make sure to include that in our, in our program as well. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. Because usually when uh, we have this uh, uh, submission from the public, uh, we send the, them also to the departments so that they prepare their responses as well. And then we'll invite them to come and uh, uh, brief the committee on their responses to the, uh, to the uh, committee, uh, to those uh, submissions. And then we deliberate as a committee and develop a, a position as I was indicating, and those positions will form part of the report that will then send to the provinces, so that when they deal with their negotiating mandates, they consider uh, uh, the submissions uh, from the public, as well as the, the responses of the department. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, I will request that uh, we um, come back um, Exactly at 20 past uh, uh, one, uh, so that we, we start uh, exactly on time at half past uh, one. Uh, the meeting is adjourned for now. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.
afternoon, honorable uh, deputy minister. Um, good afternoon to officials from the department. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. Uh, good afternoon to the TDG and uh, other officials from the department and the uh, department entities, the parliamentary staff, um, advocate Panameve, uh, staff of the committee, staff uh, from the communication unit, uh, our stakeholders, uh, media. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we going to now start uh, with the uh, meeting, the Select Committee on Trade, um, Economic Development, uh, Tourism, Small Business, uh, Employment and Labor. Uh, the name is still the same, uh, even though we still don't have uh, uh, economic development. Uh, the risk committee decided as such, so they have not uh, yet revisited uh, the name. Uh, so, uh, Deputy Minister from the DTI, you may be surprised why we still call it the economic development. We're waiting for the uh, Rules Committee to change the name. Yeah. Um, can we ask uh, the Committee uh, Secretary to indicate uh, those who are present and also if there are any apologies? Um, yes, she just said, um, in terms of members, let me just put on my camera. Um, in terms of members, the, we've got yourself, Honorable Muimang, Honorable Mamarhana, Honorable Lant, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Brafasef, and then Honorable Apleni. Um, we still have one apology from Honorable Mashori. And then um, I can see that there are still a few colleagues from the legislature also present, but I don't, I, I'm not sure which members are present today. Okay, now we welcome their presence. We uh, would like to have as many as possible, in fact, all of them if possible. Uh, but I also know that uh, uh, some uh, legislatures have also plenary sessions. I'm sure some of them uh, have now uh, joined their plenary sessions. Uh, that was the reason why I was taking the members through the process. Uh, that will be embarking upon. So we wanted them to uh, to be familiar with the process and that there will be uh, times where they will have to wait for us, uh, even if they are done with the uh, public hearings uh, before they deal with the negotiating mandates that are indicated earlier. Uh, if they can just uh, wait for us uh, to finish our processes so that they take them into account. Uh, honorable members, uh, uh, we had uh, indicated uh, earlier uh, that um, we will now be having a, a formal briefing from the Department of uh, Trade, Industry and Competition, led by uh, Honorable Deputy Minister uh, Machol. Um, I will uh, allow him to make uh, opening remarks, um, but I just want to indicate that uh, the two bills that we were going to be uh, receiving pre a presentation on were uh, bills that have been transmitted uh, from the National Assembly uh, to the NCOP. They've been passed by the uh, NA and uh, therefore has now been uh, transmitted uh, to the uh, National Council of Provinces. Uh, at the time, the NA and also the NA portfolio committees were dealing with the two bills. They were only confined uh, on the areas that uh, the president had reservations on, uh, only those areas. Um, but in our case, because one of the areas that the president had reservation on was the taking uh, of the two bills, uh, they were tagged as uh, section 77, sorry, 75 bills. Uh, 
he had reservations about that uh, because he indicated that uh, uh, some areas uh, in the law deals with uh, uh, issues of culture and also issues of trade and uh, that uh, provinces have a say on those um, uh, in terms of schedule four uh, of the constitution. So um, uh, the debate in the portfolio committee, I think also in the in EO, uh, uh, was, was that it, it was agreed uh, that it should be then retained as a section 76. Uh, because of that, it means therefore now provinces um, uh, should also be part of the process of uh, uh, lawmaking. Um, uh, that's why we decided to invite them also to be part of the workshop. Uh, other than that, if uh, uh, it was passed uh, uh, still with uh, the Section 77, uh, even ourselves as a committee would have just dealt with the, those areas uh, that the president had reservation on, but also um, and maybe then deal with the amendments that have been made uh, by the by 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 the portfolio committee and the NA in considering. Uh, uh, the areas that uh, the president had reservation on uh, on the remitted bills. Uh, now, because they are now uh, uh, retired as Section 76, uh, it means therefore we will be dealing with the entire bills, not just uh, the, the areas of reservation, uh, but also provinces will also be doing the same. They will be dealing with the two entire bills. Um, yeah, so that, that that's going to be the process. Um, let me then take this opportunity to uh, request uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister uh, to make uh, opening remarks. And uh, and then after that, uh, uh, you can then indicate who's going to uh, uh, present, but also uh, if we can also get uh, to know uh, the delegation from the side of the department and its entities. Over to you, Honorable TM. Thank you very much. I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Khai. Um, uh, good afternoon to you and uh, good afternoon to members of the select committee, members of the provincial legislatures and the officials from the DTIC and the uh, advocate for that Merve and the other members of the, uh, of the support staff of parliament. Let me also greet uh, the members of uh, the public who may be joining on the virtual platform. Honorable Chair, thanks, thanks very much for, the, for your introductory remarks. Um, <clears throat> today, we, we're making a presentation to you on the two remitted bills. Uh, as you have correctly said, this, these bills uh, were sent back to Parliament by the President after pointing out uh, the, uh, his uh, concerns with regard to certain provisions of the bills. So they've been long in the parliamentary process uh, during the, in the May process. We had had long discussions, including uh, whether or not we should uh, advertise only the, the concerns that uh, the president had raised, or we should go beyond the, the concerns that the president raised. So there's, there's been a long process uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Masocha will go through in a, in a minute. Um, uh, the... There, there are quite extensive uh, 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 amendments, uh, Honorable Chair and members of the, of the select committee. And many of them uh, are technical uh, changes. So it may take a while just to go through them to indicate how they arose and uh, what changes uh, the, the, the the portfolio committee has uh, has effected uh, working together with the parliamentary legal services. Um, the 
I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Masocha to make the presentation and she'll also indicate who are the colleagues from the, the DTIC who are present uh, in, the, in the committee meeting. Um, uh, so we will ask for your indulgence, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. I do know that the last time we had having a discussion on on these amendments, uh, they they quite they quite uh, extensive and they could take uh, quite a while. Uh, so um, uh, at the end, we will will take questions. And uh, from what uh, you have now said, Chairperson, uh, it is clear that uh, we will will still take long in the process of finalizing these two bills, uh, given how they've been tagged. Uh, so, but we're hoping that. Uh, we will will get to the point where they can be passed by the uh, by the the NCOP and that they can be uh, sent back to the president of the republic without uh, further delay. So, with that, uh, honourable chair, thanks very much once again for the time. And uh, if your permission, I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Masocha. Uh, our Deputy Director General to lead the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable T.M. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Masus. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Deputy Minister. Good afternoon to all the Honorable Members from the Provincial Legislatures. I'm going to, oh, sorry, and also the public, all the members of the public who are in the platform and the media. Uh, welcome to all of you. And as a department, we want to say thank you for this opportunity to present um, Advocate um, van der Merve, a very instrumental person in these processes, um, to also um, acknowledge her and her team, as well as the parliamentary staff. Uh, from the DTIC side, um, it's, it's myself, Dr. Evelyn Masoja, as a DDG for the Consumer and Corporate Regulation Branch. I'm with Dr. Ria Nonyana Mukabani, who's the Chief Director for Drafting, Ms. Mishendri Parayachi, who is the uh, manager responsible for intellectual property in our branch. And also from the uh, CIPC, our entity, we have Mr. Gadi Peje, who's the manager responsible for copyright and IP. And also to recognize the commissioner in absentia, um, advocate Arori Vola, who is the head of the, uh, the commissioner for the uh, CIPC. And we also have uh, with us Ms. Clementine Magabia, who is the chief director responsible for, for regulatory policy and legislation. And our legal services is here, um, advocate Nkamba, um, Dokozo, as well as um, Ms. Marisa van Niekerk, uh, who are also part of the legislative processes in the department. And all the other colleagues that we work closely with, Ms. Kulu Falomushi, uh, Ms. Saroj Naidu, who are parliamentary in their responsibilities. From our side as the DTIC, we are going to present the two bills. So what we have done is to combine them in one presentation. And as the Deputy Minister has indicated, they are quite um, 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 cumbersome in terms of the size and the scope of the work. Um, they range beyond the reservations that the, president's ha the president has raised, plus the, the issues that were deliberated in the portfolio committee. So um, we will take a bit of time. I will try in the presentation to uh, expedite um, and maybe to ensure that for areas that I'm aware they were covered slightly in the workshop, uh, one will move a bit faster in those areas. So I'm going to now flag the presentation and uh, comments with the with the presentation. Um, just, just a minute, uh, uh, Doctor. I just want to check if uh, the Office of the State Law Advisor is represented, uh, uh, Ms. Matia. Uh, Chief Person, um, I will ask Advocate Van der Merwe to come in with regards to that um, because he was, um, we, we did extend the invitation to the Office of the State Law Advisor. Um, but Advocate Van der Merwe, if she can maybe just come in with um, input with regards to that issue. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you Chairperson. Um, Chair, because of the, the lengthy period of time that the bills have taken, the person in the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor that dealt, dealt with the bills have retired. 
So when the bills were referred back by the presidency, they were allocated to two people in the office of the chief state law advisor, but they expressed a concern about getting into the bills at this very late stage. So we've tried from our side to keep them informed, um, but in any event, their assistance is more to the department itself, and and um, you would have known to the department came with with their their big team, so they have sort of made up for the loss of that assistance. Um, and then from my side, I try to assist the committee as, as best I can in respect of the drafting requirements and and so on. But so, yeah, so from, from their side, they indicated it's a bit late for them to, to get involved in such a complex piece of legislation. And um, yeah, we try and keep them updated, but um, we, we do our best to assist the committee without them. Thanks, Jay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate. Uh, sorry, Doc, uh, you can continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to check from your side, Chair, is the presentation visible? Yes, it is visible. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of the outline of the presentation, uh, the areas that will be covered is mainly the background to, the, to, the, to both bills. We'll start with the Copyright Amendment Bill. We'll also talk to the reservations that we raised by the President and then go into the specific provisions. And it will be comprehensive in terms of including the entire bill, not just the areas that were highlighted by the president. This will also apply to the performance protection amendment bill. So the main uh, uh, crux of the matter will be the provisions, but I think also given that long passage of the two bills, it is important to also speak to the processes of what has uh, been done by the department, by parliament, uh, since they uh, became uh, they came into um, uh, um, into inception, and um, mainly for the purposes of the presentation, we are here as a DTIC to brief the civil committee um, on the two remitted bills. This slide is quite busy. I, I uh, we decided to incorporate it because it's uh, it's, it's it serves as a as a diagram or a picture of what has transpired with these bills um, over the years and what informed some of the changes or most of the amendments that we have today. And um, just to highlight, which is something that has been raised, uh, both legislation are quite dated, uh, going back to as early as the, the, during the 70s and the 60s, 1967 for the Performance Protection Copyright Act 1978. So much has happened in the intellectual property landscape since then in terms of the treaties, international treaties, the digital advancement in the world and the, the rights that has to be protected and, 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 and nurtured for um, rights holders from your performers, your authors, copyright owners, and, and so on. So in terms of where the passage of these bills were coming from, we looked at the timelines as far back as 1998, um, where various processes were put in place to look at how to ensure that um, artists are, are catered for, they do not um, die without reaping the benefits of the, the economic rights and the works that they, they, they put forward, their creativity. And um, there were changes that um, took place in our legislative uh, processes. Uh, in 2002, Parliament passed amendments to the Copyright Act, uh, introducing middle time uh, for, for, for the music industry in terms of the sound recording uh, sector. And also in 2006, there were regulations that were enacted for the collecting society and then in 2009, the president then met with the creative industry and he had a, a, a consultation with them to discuss the issues that impacted on them, as well as the, the, what, the strategies that could be put in place to address their plight. Um, in 2010, the department then um, established a commission that was uh, chaired by the, 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 the judge, um, Ayn Afalam, who's a former judge, um, and he was heading that commission with other commissioners. The Copyright Review Commission was very critical for this amendment bill, uh, even for the performers, because it came up with recommendations that were taken into consideration in the amendment um, process. 
And also in the processes, there were studies that the department undertook to ensure that um, the, the, the policies uh, or the policy and the measures introduced in the legislation are evidence-based and there is uh, research that informed them. Um, one of them was a study that looked at the economic impact or the economic uh, indication from the copyright-based industries, which had other, which came up with recommendations in terms of the importance of copyright-based industries uh, for the economy. And, and the department then came up with measures to support the creative industry. One of them was around the issues of formalization, where there were different consultation with industry to look at how to formalize uh, for them to be able to be organized in an economic manner so that they can benefit from the economy. And in 2013, um, the department published a draft national IP policy. So, it's included here because it talks to the passage of policy and, and progress that the department made in terms of intellectual property rights in the country. And uh, then in 2014, there was a regulatory impact assessment study that was um, prepared, uh, completed by the department. This study, obviously, we haven't published it in the public, but it is there in terms of the uh, findings and the some of the measures that informed the amendments that we have. And um, both, um, initially the Copyright Amendment Bill was introduced in, um, in 2017, and then the performance protection as well. So this, the parliamentary processes kick-started in 2017. In 2018, they continued, and there were subcommittees that were formed in parliament to ensure that the work is properly consolidated, um, there were drafting issues that were also attended to around that time. Experts were brought on board to assist with the preparations of these bills. And by December of 2018, the National Assembly adopted both bills and the NCOP adopted them in March of 2019. And in 2020, um, they were then, uh, they were then uh, referred to the president and they were, after that, uh, in 2020, they were referred back to parliament through the Speaker of National Assembly for them to be brought back to, to, to parliament for further consideration because of the constitutional consideration that the president had reservations about. The next few slides, um, we thought they should be added in the discussions because they speak to the question of what informed the bills. And as already mentioned from the diagram, the issue of the Copyright Review Commission, uh, the commission that uh, was led to look at issues affecting mainly the music industry, uh, issues of royalties and um, collecting societies. So it, it came up with recommendations. Some of them, uh, they were, they informed way the bills. So the thinking was that by showcasing this is just to also indicate that um, where the, some of the amendments are coming from. For instance, um, some of what part of the recommendations included that South Africa should amend its act by adopting the right to communicate literary and musical work to the public and to, to make uh, to, to the right to make available copies of sound recording, recordings to the public. This is a digital right that is also in the WIPO Copyright Treaty. I'll speak a bit to the treaties in the next slides. So um, the digital rights around that work of sound recordings, musical works uh, was also highlighted in the Copyright Review Commission. Um, another recommendation made was around the collecting societies. So at the time, uh, we were talking about the registrar when you talk about the commission, the commissioner. And um, there was a recommendation that there should be um, an administration of collecting societies and, and there should be uh, some kind of uh, governance around them. So this was also part of that, the recommendations around that. And also some of the uh, recommendations were not factored in. They were considered in the initial debates in parliament and some of them fell off. For example, the one collecting society, Perite, is one of those examples. However, this is just to demonstrate that the changes were informed. For instance, in the second bullet on the presentation, they, uh, it talks to the Copyright Tribunal that would look at other issues um, over and above the current uh, role that the tribunal plays. 
Another amendment was around the reversionary rights, which are linked to assignments of rights that um, the copyright ex, uh, the, 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 this must be, to say that this must be modeled according to the US Copyright Act, uh, providing that reversion of assigned rights um, can be assigned back after 25 years after the copyright came into existence. So this is just to, yeah, so I will maybe leave it from this side just to indicate that there was that review commission that informed uh, some of the changes that are in the legislation currently. I'm not gonna talk much on this slide, uh, but just to indicate that the way studies that were done, um, I think right now, if I count correctly, there are more than five different researches that were done. Some of them were done with academic institutions, um, various experts, some of them were informed by work done by uh, service providers, like the impact assessment that I spoke to. Uh, I know that in the public domain, there are experts who are questioning its credibility. However, there was resources put into that study. It has recommendations and is a study that is um, part of the work that was done by the department. And then the same applies to the, uh, the copyright, the treaties that informed the, the, the bills and then there's this, this process that we undertake every time we go into a legislative process with the presidency uh, to deal with the socioeconomic impact assessments. Although it's not a legal requirement, I know that stakeholders have a concern about this one to say that um, they, they, they want access to this and what are the issues around the economic impact assessment. But from our side and in terms of our record, this work was done as part of the package of what informed uh, the bills. So in terms of the, the processes, um, in terms of section 79 of uh, subsection one of the constitution, um, the president must either assent to and sign a bill. Uh, and if the president has reservations about the constitutionality referred back to the national assembly for reconsideration, which is the reason why we are here. So from the department side, Following that uh, reverse, the, when the president returned the bills, there was an initial briefing that we did in the portfolio committee on trade and industry. And the minister also contributed. He was part of those deliberations. Uh, and the department also pre presented the clauses as well as the, um, the treaties, international treaties implications, just to assist, to, to, add, to show where the changes were. And this slide is coming from the portfolio committee side. It's just to highlight the work the committee has done and also representing the work that has been done by the parliamentary legal services uh, um, with the leadership of advocate Charmaine van der Merwe and the colleagues from parliament. It's, I'm gonna talk, talk to it very quickly. I won't take long around it, but just to showcase the steps the committee undertook to this point and the, the different processes that they have followed. So on the 1st of June, the National Assembly adopted the committee's report in which the committee outlined how it intended to correct any procedural defect. And then on the 4th of June of 2021, the committee placed adverts in the national and regional newspapers inviting stakeholders and interested parties to submit written submissions with reference to the alignment of the uh, Performance Protection Amendment Bill with the obligations set out in international treaties. Um, at the time, the committee received 91 submissions in this regard. Furthermore, there were public hearings that took place, and then there was a workshop that was held, similar to the workshop that was held um, currently for the members of parliament. There was one on the 3rd and 4th of August of 2021 to provide the new members of the portfolio committee with a conceptual framework of copyright and related rights. So on the 11th and the 12th of August, the committee held public hearings. And these public he hearings um, included submissions and presentations by uh, stakeholders from various copyright-based industries, and they brought issues and concerns they had about the bills. And following that, on the 11th and the 12th of November, the committee received a response with regard to the oral and written submissions received in relation to the president reservations from the department and from parliament legal services. So we, both of us responded, the department and parliament responded to those to, to the submissions and the issues raised by the public. 
Then on the 19th of November, 2021, the committee adopted its report seeking permission from the National Assembly in terms of the Assembly Rule 286-4C for it to amend other provisions of the Copyright Act. And the same applied to the Performance Protection Amendment, both bills. And then on the 1st of December, the National Assembly granted the committee permission to inquire into amending other provisions of the Act. And then on the 4th of, of December, the committee placed adverts in national and regional newspapers inviting stakeholders and interested parties to submit written submissions um, on the additional proposed provisions to the Copyright Act. And at the time, the 53 submissions were, re were, were received in that regard. On the 6th of May, the committee received a response with regard to these written submissions received from the Department and Parliament's Constitutional and Legal Services, respectively. The deliberations were held and they continued from the 11th, 17th, 18th, and 25th of May uh, to consider the inputs and responses from the Department and Parliament. And then on the 8th of June, the committee formally considered the amendments to, the, to, to, both, uh, to both bills. So this slide has got some repetition. I will try not to get into them. Um, I think I'll emphasize that there were specific provisions that the president raised uh, reservations about, and they include sections 12A, 12B, um, 12D on the education, uh, 19C on the libraries, archives, and museums, um, and also on uh, persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, there, were, there were concerns raised. Some of them were not specific, they were broad, um, especially on the international treaty implications. And all these uh, culminated into those adverts that were mentioned in terms of the call for public comments. And the further deliberations necess necessitated that provisions are amended and, and, and advertised and put out to the public. So in terms of the final outcome of that process, when there were draft amendments, um, there were mixed views about the proposed amendments that were made. There were stakeholders who were and are still of the view that amendments went beyond the president's reservations. And in such instances, the response or clarity we provided was that they were not beyond, they, they, these were provisions that had treaty related implications. So where stakeholders indicated a particular treaty can be attended to, um, there were some of the provisions then considered for further advertising and where permission was sought to put them out in the public. And in terms of the final implications, there were provisions that were debated extensively that had other unintended consequences. So one will try as I go through the slides to indicate where changes were made on the bill that was before the bill was published. And um, so in terms of the final outcome, the National Assembly adopted the bills on the 1st of September and referred them to the NCOP for, for concurrence. I'm going to speak quickly to some of the objectives of the bill and I'm hoping that it will also assist in terms of the further deliberations in terms of some of the core provisions um, and hoping that also a bit of background provided in terms of where they are coming from will also um, add to that to, to further deliberations and considerations. So, so sorry. Um, yeah. So in terms of the objectives of the the bill, the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, it is to develop a legal framework on copyright and related rights that will promote accessibility to producers, users, and consumers in a balanced manner. This includes flexibilities and advancements in the digital space that should empower all a uh, sphere of the citizens of South Africa. Just briefly, um, in our context, when we say copyright, we are referring to uh, author's right, uh, which is a legal term used to describe the rights that creators have over their literary and artistic works and other works. And the works that we are referring to can range from books, music, paintings, sculptures, films, 
computer programs, databases, and, and so on. It's just to just give that background uh, description of what we are referring to um, in terms of, of copyright. And because in copyright, we use the word copy uh, 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 significantly. When one refers to copy, it means the reproduction of a work um, uh, where work is being um, reproduced or adopted further. So the, the bill also aimed to introduce provisions which deal with matters pertaining to collective management. Uh, collectives, collecting societies um, or in terms of the bill will only be allowed to collect for their registered members and all collecting societies have to be accredited with the companies and intellectual property commission. So this is one of the objectives to, to strengthen the collecting societies um, regime in terms of how the governance of these uh, collecting societies are managed and how they should operate in terms of uh, membership, um, corporate governance, reporting, and, and, and so on. And also, to deal with protection of works and rights of authors in the digital environment. Um, the world has shifted so much, social media, the digital space is wide. So there is a need for protection of works and rights of, rights of authors in the digital environment. And also it provides for standard contractual terms to empower authors when negotiating contracts. This will also close the loophole that has resulted in unfair contractual terms that has led to creators signing away their rights. We also in the bill introduce a royalty right called a resale royalty right. So this is a right that um, is provided for, which means that for original works of art, like your fine paintings, every time they are being resold, reused, the originators then are entitled to royalties. It's a special kind of a, of a royalty. And very critical, the bill also introduces the fair use system for the re reproduction of copyright material for limited uses or purposes without obtaining permission and without paying a fee or a royalty. Furthermore, this provision stipulates the factors that needs to be considered in determining whether the copyright work is used fairly. This is one area that has been highly debated highly contentious. And uh, we anticipate that we will be seeing more submissions around it because of the different systems that are in place related to this. The current act provides for fair dealing. We are not yet in the fair use system. A good example of a fair use, which has been highly debated is around the US. Uh, they have a similar system. And yeah, lots of debates are anticipated. They were there even uh, throughout the parliamentary process outside and we anticipate a similar uh, debate around them of, on, on this system going forward. And in terms of the exceptions and limitations, um, the exceptions also form part of the main issues raised by the president, talking to examples of the exceptions, education libraries, archives and museums, computer programs, um, the issues around persons with disabilities, dealing with accessible format copies, um, and, 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 other, um, and other exceptions like your quotations, uh, uh, translations and, and so on. Uh, and then most importantly is the issue of royalties. The current act provides for royalties to a limited extent. This uh, bill extends it further with more clarity on the works and also addressing issues of assignment and authorization of uh, use of works and and also the other issue is around, it's around the recorder of works. So it, currently there is an issue around, for instance, I'll use an example of the, the film industry or in the broadcasting when you deal with issues of um, actors, uh, when their works are being rebroadcasted and there's no proper system of recording of usage of copyright works. This can apply to music, this can apply to your, 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 your audiovisual works, including films, um, the, 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 the different clips that we see on television. Um, there has been an outcry, especially from our uh, beloved actors and, 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 and creators who uh, say that they 
uh, they, they, there's no clarity around the, the usage of their works and that when their works are being put out there, there's no proper record system. So it also affects issues around the payments of royalties. It's more so in the music industry. So hence, this has been one of the areas that the previous committee spent more time on to ensure that this issue is taken seriously and also introducing serious penalties and offenses around this. And then the Copyright Tribunal um, as a dispute mechanism was is also in, introduced in the bill. It, it currently exists, but it has got limited scope. The current one, the, 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 the future one that we envisage is going to look at various disputes and dealing with issues of contracts, royalties, disputes, and, and different uh, provisions of the, of the act. And, uh, and furthermore, the rights of authors in commissioned works, the work that is commissioned, the rights around commissioned works, how the commissioned works should be attended to. And furthermore, there's introduction of technological protection measures. As the digital space expands, the need for protection also expands and the technological protection measures are very critical in ensuring a balance between protection and access to copyright works. The next slide focuses on the treaties that informed the bills. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just to highlight what the slides are covering because the clauses, some of the, in fact, some of the clauses were informed by these treaties and it's important that they, attend, they are attended to. Um, I think earlier, uh, my colleague, Mr. Beje, uh, was presenting to some extent on some of the treaties. I will repeat some of it. Hopefully it will also strengthen the uh, clarities around how they informed the bills. So the first one to be attended to is the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty. This is uh, administered by the World Intellectual Property Organizations. It deals with the rights, uh, two rights uh, for beneficiaries in the digital environment. It deals with performers. The performance means actors, singers, musicians, and also producers of phonograms or producers of sound recordings. So these are persons or legal entities that take the initiative and have the responsibility for the fixation of sounds. Currently, South Africa is not a member. Um, we, Parliament uh, adopted um, the, 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 uh, the, this treaty, both houses of Parliament. They are ready for consideration uh, when they are tabled at the at the WIPO. So the other processes have been undertaken. We are just waiting for the parliamentary processes to be finalized, but they are ready to be deposited further. The other treaty is the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances that deals with the intellectual property rights of performers in audiovisual performances. It is administered by WIPO. We are also not a member. It is also another treaty that has been um, adopted by both houses of parliament, also ready to be uh, tabled or deposited via DECO to, to, to WIPO. Then we have the WIPO Copyright Treaty uh, that deals with protection for authors of literary and music artistic works, uh, such as writings and computer programs, original databases, musical works, um, audiovisual works uh, of fine arts and photographs. Photographs. We are also not a member of this particular treaty. The other treaty is the Marrakesh uh, Treaty to facilitate for the visually impaired persons. Um, this treaty is very important. And we, we tried as a department also to ensure that it's aligned with the others for, um, for readiness for, um, to be ratified. And it is a treaty that we will be uh, on ongoing basis trying to uh, finalize to ensure that it's, it's in alignment. It awaits the legislative processes as per the advice that we have been given around it. And uh, currently we are not a member of this treaty. And then the processes that we followed for the others, we are going to also do the same for it. And in terms of the Bain Convention, we are a member. It deals with the protection of literary and artistic works. The reservations of the president. I'm going to speak high level on them. 
I, I, I do think that they were talked to in the previous discussions in the workshops. Um, I'll list them and talk to the main issue around them. And um, that's where the focus in the other house was around them. Sorry, um, Doc. So, sorry, Dr. Thomas. We, we didn't deal with the bills. Uh, we just generally dealt with the law. Uh, so maybe you can... Uh, uh, maybe be specific on this uh, slide because we also uh, want uh, or urge the, the panelists not to deal with the merits or demerits of the two bills. Thank, I don't thank know. you, Chair. Yeah, so, no, no, so I, I, they, uh, maybe you can also uh, maybe go to town in terms of explaining uh, uh, this particular slide. Thank, thank you, Chair, for the permission. Um, much appreciated. I will do so. So the president raised reservations um, in his letter to the Speaker of National Assembly around the reservations that he had with the, the two bills. I'm going to speak to them. Some of them are not in the order they were in, um, but you will see the indication of what they were or what they are. The first one, so some, okay, so the category of them is, is, is procedural defects and substantive uh, defects. So um, the incorrect tagging is one of the areas that we raised. And then Chair spoke to it briefly in terms of why the bills had to be re-tagged from Section 75 with emphasis only on the national uh, legislative legislation with less emphasis on provinces uh, because of the constitutional emphasis of some of these, the bills that have got the implications of provinces. So initially, when they were introduced to parliament, these two bills were um, the section 75 bills. And we were of the view because it's intellectual property, um, they don't have too much of a provincial emphasis. However, in terms of the reservation, the president was of the view that the bills, uh, the bills are incorrectly tagged and that in fact, they are section 76 bills because of the cultural matters and trade, that they have implications for trade and also imp implications for culture. And that in terms of the constitution, they should be section 76. On that basis, the bills were then referred to the joint taking mechanism and they were, um, they were, they were retagged and uh, this also followed deliberations in, in the committee. So they were then retagged to section 76 bills with uh, focusing on not only from a national perspective, but provincial mandates that will also follow in terms of this process. Then there was another issue that was raised around the retrospective and arbitra arbitrary deprivations of property. So this speaks to the royalty related clauses in the bill. There was work that was done by the portfolio committee where the thinking was that many of our creators, artists, musicians, uh, they have challenges, including other, other um, 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 authors, not just in terms of music, uh, in films, in, in literary works, your, your authors, your writers, they, um, they face a challenge that some of them in the past entered into contractual arrangements that were unfair. Some signed away their rights without awareness or without knowledge. Others, because of maybe being desperate, you sign a contract um, and you're only given so much, but then later on, there's more that comes from the work that you had produced. And as an author, you don't get anything further. So there were all these disadvantages that were discussed. And, and, and because of that, the committee at the time felt that there was a need to ensure that these royalties have got retrospective application. Retrospective application meaning that um, if there was there's still economic value that is being derived from a work, even after the act is passed, you can go further back to get those royalties. That's where the retrospective application issue came from. And um, this was highly contentious. Um, there, were, there, there was advice 
issued by the department, there was advice issued by parliament that we're of the view that because of the gaps and the uncertainties around how do you determine when this, how far back this can go and in terms of the specifics of assessing the scope of the royalties, the rights, we were of the view that this may be found to be unconstitutional but because of the policy rationale, because of the importance of this issue, and the fact that we lost many of our creators, very instrumental people in our society who forms part of our heritage, um, who are part of our historical context, who contributed so much and they never benefited from their works and they were exploited. Parliament felt strongly that this retrospective provisions must be retained. And um, so this, this, the policy rationale was very strong. The current context was very strong. So um, the president did raise reservations about this uh, to say that this may constitute um, retrospect retrospective and arbitrary deprivation of property in that copyright owners will be entitled to a lesser share of the fruit of their property than was previously the case. Um, so he raised reservations with those royalty clauses and that the provisions were seen to be um, reaching over, the going beyond the scope um, uh, of the very same authors it was seeking to protect. And then there was a view that this would deprive the copyright owners of property without sufficient reason. And it will result in substantial arbitrary deprivation of property. So, it was recommended that these provisions be removed from the from the from the bill, especially on the in the in the copyright amendment bill. Um, in the clauses, I will indicate the specific areas where they were removed, but it's in those sections six a, seven a, and eight a where there was those retrospective applications of uh, royalty provisions. Going with this retrospective provisions, when the concerns were raised that there could be the, uh, the constitutionality question, that these are not constitutional. Um, as we, there was a parliament then undertook to give, to ensure that there's due diligence that is conducted around those provisions. So the minister was therefore empowered to conduct an impact assessment and develop regulations that will be tabled in the National Assembly. Um, these provisions were included to ensure that the royalties are dispensed responsibly after further study and they're not arbitrary. So the questions of how far back will the retrospective um, royalties go? Um, how will you ensure that there's, the, 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 there's fairness in the process? And how will you quantify the scope of what is going to be considered to be what is the correct amount of royalty from say 1980 or um, 1990 for, for argument's sake. So that th there were a lot of questions that required more time and research to ensure that um, there, is, there, there is no further arbitrariness and unfairness in the process. Uh, because of the reservation of the president, um, it was undertaken that these provisions uh, linked to the retrospective uh, provisions should be removed from the from the copyright amendment bill, and they were um, substan um, they were ultimately then removed uh, subsequently from the from the bill. The other provision was around fair use. The president raised concern with fair use um, with the content taken as is from the letter. It was saying that. Following the public hearings in August 2017, substantial amendments were effected to various sections of the bill, including section 12A, which has the fair use provision. The relevant provisions as amended were not put out for public comment before the final bill was published. The changes to the section were material to the scheme as a whole and failure to consult could render the provisions unconstitutional. So, there was a view that changes that were in the final bill related to fair use were not they were not properly consulted upon. And um, there were concerns that the issue of consultation could render them unconstitutional. Hence the issue was raised again in his reservation for further consideration by the committee. 
Then in terms of the copyright exceptions, um, there were some subsections that the president raised. Um, so the bill does introduce exceptions. It must be highlighted that currently in the fair dealing regime in the current act, there are exceptions. Um, however, these exceptions are more extensive. They are also in line with uh, various uh, global processes and um, developments over time from 1978 to now. So he was of the view that the sections, the subsections and sections that he highlighted uh, may encounter constitutional challenges um, and they were cited as listed there, like 12A, 12B1A, I, 12B1C, um, the A1 is on quotations, um, there's one for ephemeral rights uh, on, on, on the sound recordings and the broadcasters, um, 12B1E uh, on uh, current events, translations, and then on the education um, rights for libraries, archives and museums, and he was of the view that these specific subsections may constitute deprivation of property. Um, and that for section 12A that has got fair use and 12D on education, they may further violate the right to freedom of trade, occupation and profession, which is a constitutional right. Um, so other rights that were cited by the president include other copyright exceptions listed in his reservations. Um, and, and some of them, um, so, so, so on the issue of the, 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 the trade and, and, and the, the possible conflict um, um, with, the, with the rights of the authors and the copyright owners. And in terms of the international treaty implications as the last um, reservation, he raised the fact that um, there might be reservations about whether these bills comply with the international treaties. In terms of the letter, there were no specific issues here. Uh, uh, there were no specific issues that he raised re related to the reservations um, or in terms of the treaties, um, uh, but he referred them back for parliament to look at them, uh, to consider them against the international obligations of South Africa. So these are the main areas that were listed on his letter to the to the to parliament. And in the next slides, one is going to look at the bills. Um, in, in this case, the copyright amendment bill in terms of specific clauses, uh, what the clauses provide for and where changes were made in the National Assembly, I will try to highlight them to say this is where slight changes were made. But because of the issue of the unintended consequences that was highlighted in my previous slides, there were substantive issues raised, but then because of the various experts advices we received, some of them were not taken forward because they require further work, they require more, assessments of their implications. So you'll notice that some of the changes that one speaks to are very technical. It will be a word here and there, uh, but not too substantive. It will be uh, considerations that were taken all after all the considerations. So I'm gonna start with the clause one, which is about the definitions. So the definitions um, that are in the copyright amendment bill, some of them I will list them I will not go into their details, but I will highlight the ones that were affected by the processes of the presidential reservations. So the, um, the definitions include your accessible format copy. This is a copy uh, made in terms of um, ac accessibility for persons uh, with disability. There's a definition in the, in the bill. And also there's a definition of ad market professional who can be an ad dealership, um, an, author, an institution dealing with art, uh, like your, your museum and so on, but it's mainly the, the art dealers and so on. Authorized entities, um, these are the author, uh, institutions, organizations that will be authorized as prescribed to provide accessible format copies for persons with disability. Uh, these are definitions that have got authorized entities in the Marrakesh Treaty, 
Um, it also aligns to the accessible format copy definition. And then the definition of broadcast, um, it was included in the Copyright Amendment Bill to align it with the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. Definition of collecting society, definition of commercial, the Companies Act is defined, the copyright management information, open license, often work. Often work is a work where uh, an author uh, or the owner cannot, the owner cannot be, um, cannot be found or if they can be found, they cannot be um, located, which then makes the work uh, to be, it requires a process of how to manage that work. And then the definition of performer, uh, then the person with a disability, and then technologically protected work and technological protection measure. And then the technological protection measure circumvention device or service. The word service was added as informed by the deliberations and then the tribunal. So the changes that were affected in terms of the definition, in terms of the accessible format copy definition, the word including two was added. This was not part of the advertised clauses, but it was highlighted for further consideration to make sure that it aligns to the Marrakesh Treaty. And then the definition of authorized entity is a new definition. It was not in the published bill. And then the definition of broadcast was added to the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, there was a debate around the use of the word wire or wireless. Um, in conclusion, wire is also included as it was published uh, and finalized in the previous bill uh, in, the, in the performance protection. And then the technological protection measure definition to include product, uh, product was added. And the technological protection measure circumvention device um, in terms of the definition of that device, the word service was added. Um, both the definition of broadcast and technology, both technological protection measures uh, were deliberated extensively. Um, there were issues around processes with the broadcast definition globally with the treaties that is being debated and the work that is being done in the government currently around broadcasting. And uh, for the technological protection measures, uh, although there were experts of the view that there should be changes introduced to tighten these definitions, there were also stronger views that where in countries these issues have been applied, for example, in the US and other countries, there are indications of other implications from competition implications consumer protection implications so that, and, and the view that bringing them in now may have unintended consequences for the country. And it may also not bring the benefits that the changes were going to be proposed for. So, and for instance, affecting the balance between the usage of copyright exceptions versus the rights of the authors and the owners. So that issue it remained a contentious one of debate. So that's why the changes seem a bit more technical where product is added or service without too much substantive um, considerations given the work that was done. So in terms of the next provision, which is clause two, um, it's, um, it's it inserts section 2A, it talks to the scope of copyright protection. This only clarifies what does not, what does not constitute protection in terms of copyright. For instance, the clause provides that copyright protection subsists in expressions and not in ideas uh, and not in procedures, in methods of operation or mathematical concepts. And for example, in, in cases of con computer programs, in, um, interface specifications like your manuals, they don't constitute um, copyright protection. And also there's no protection to an expression of official text of legislation or speeches of a political nature, except maybe where the author is given exclusive rights to, to produce them and then they, they can qualify. But overall, these are some of the uh, act actions or activities that or usages that do not constitute what is um, copyright. Clause three, uh, proposes an amendment to section five. It focuses on the state or organization that um, have copyright. These organizations and, um, uh, uh, and the state government where they control or copyright is made under their direction. 
uh, for example, the right, say for instance, the DTIC has incentive programs. Um, the, 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 that work is, belongs to the department. So as an example, so it's about the work that is controlled and owned by a particular organization or government um, and it's copyright. Then for the next clause is clause four. This one talks to communication to the public of a literary or musical work and making available to the public and distribution of an original or a copy of a work. These are digital rights. Uh, this is where the WIPO Copyright Treaty comes in. So this amendment proposes an amendment to section six of the act by providing for communication to the public of a musical work by wire or wireless means, including internet access and making available to the public a work in such a way that members of the public may access such a work from a place and at the time chosen by them, whether interactively or non-interactively. So it's about access to the works uh, by digital forms. Then the share of royalty um, is clause five of the bill, which proposes an insertion of a new section 6A, uh, specifically providing for royalty sharing after assignment of copyright in a literary or musical work or where the author of a literary or musical work authorized another to do any of the acts contemplated in section six, the share of royalties to be determined by written agreement in a prescribed manner. So in this case, the royalty provision is strengthened to ensure that when a, an author um, authorizes the use of the work or they assign, they are also entitled to a royalty. And that in that provision, there's also um, the role of the tribunal. There's also the issue of the agreement and what the agreement should be able to cover for that work. So this provision is, will be similar to the one for the visual artistic works and also for the films, for the audiovisual works. They are similar in nature. They cater for what could be authorized um, and also um, the assignment aspect, but then it strengthens the way royalties are catered for in the Copyright Act. And then the next um, provision is the distribution of an artistic work uh, including communication to the public and making available to the public. So this is similar to the one I've already indicated for musical or literary works. So clause six of the bill proposes an amendment to section seven by providing for the distribution of an artistic work to the public, um, communication to the public of an artistic work by wire or wireless means, including internet access and make. So it's similar to the previous one, but dealing with the visual artistic works. Then um, in terms of the royalty sharing is the same principle of royalty that is shared um, by the copyright owner and the author, and also looking at the assignment aspect and the authorizing of the use of the work and the royalties that are assigned to certain exclusive rights uh, related to that work. And um, the resale royalty right, I've mentioned it on the objectives. This is an, a, a new royalty right. Uh, whenever the work is reused, uh, original work, royalty, uh, resale royalty right, it, it, it kicks in. So clause seven, um, it inserts section 7B that provides that the author of visual artistic work in which copyrights have subsists or his or her A must be paid royalties on the commercial resale within the ad market of that work. Royalties in respect of visual artistic work shall be payable at the rate that is prescribed by the Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition after he consults with the responsible Minister for Arts and Culture. So the royalty rate is set by the arrangement consultation between the two ministers. And we also say that the seller and the ad market professional are jointly and severally liable to pay the royalties to the author. It also provides in section 7C to E for authors of visual artistic works to enjoy the inalienable resale royalty right on the commercial resale of his or her original work of art and subsequent to the first assignment by the author of such work of art. This includes the right in terms of resale. Uh, the, the provision also includes the resale, the duration, 
assignment or waiver of the resale royalty right. Um, this right will only apply after the commencement of the Copyright Amendment Act once it, it comes into pass. And uh, furthermore, Clause 8 of the bill proposes an amendment to Section 8 of the Act by providing for the distribution of an audiovisual work to the public, authorizing commercial uh, rental of the work to the public, communication to the public of an audiovisual work by wire or wireless means, including internet access. This is similar to 6A and 7A, the digital rights. Um, so this is uh, similar to those digital rights that I've mentioned, but in this particular case, when it comes to the audiovisual works. And um, in terms of the, the royalty sharings between performers and copyright owners of audiovisual works, Clause 9 of the bill inserts a new section 8A, specifically providing for royalty sharing between performers and the copyright owner of audiovisual works for any of the acts contemplated in section 8. The share of royalties to be determined by a written agreement in a prescribed manner. And because of the issue that I raised about the usage of the works, where a particular, say, a particular uh, soapy will be repeated and the actors and actresses are, are in that process, but they don't, the recording is not made. So the bill empowers that there is a recorder of the usage. Um, every time the use of the work of the performer is being used and it has got penalties and offenses for failure to do so. And then um, moving forward to clause 10 um, of the bill, it proposes the amendment to section nine of the act providing for the distribution of a sound recording to the public, authorizing commercial rental of the work to the public, communication to the public of such sound recording by wire or wireless means, um, similar to the, the, the other, digital, uh, other digital rights. And one of the key amendments around the sound recording is the equal sharing of royalties between the owner of the copyright, the collecting society, or indigenous community subject to the agreement, meaning that um, the, the royalty must be equally shared. And this is an arrangement at the time we, we understood uh, made with the, with the industry around this equal sharing of, of royalty, especially for the music industry and uh, sound recordings. Now um, I'm, I'm going to speak to the um, part of the deliberations in the committee in the National Assembly around the retrospective royalties. I've already spoken to the rationale, the policy consideration around them, and also looking at the, the, the powers of the minister to issue out the um, regulations and the impact assessment study. All these provisions were deleted in the, in the, in the, in the bill. Uh, following the deliberations around them. So they, they are no longer applicable. They have been removed from the, from the bill. So two of the issues that the president raised has been addressed. Um, they were removed uh, on the retrospective uh, arbitrary deprivation and also the, permissive, the, the, the powers of the minister. So they, yeah, they've been deleted. And then in terms of clause 11, uh, of the bill. This clause, it proposes the substitution of section 9A of the act. It requires the recording and reporting of any act contemplated. So this is similar to the, the recording of the example I provided around say the performance of actors and actresses and the usage of their works. But this, in this case, it, it applies to um, music industry, um, the sound recordings where the work is being used in certain, certain manners um, uh, made available in the public, they should be recorder of the usage. And then there's also um, penalties and offense, I mean, there's offense, um, the, there's offenses around this. Um, the offense provides that a person convicted of an offense shall be liable for a fine or imprisonment for a period not exceeding five years or both such fine and imprisonment. And also there is a um, consideration for non-natural persons. Uh, the annual turnover of a convicted person that is not a natural person at the time assessed is the total income of that person during the financial year during which the offense 
or the majority of the offenses uh, applies. So the issue of recording of usage is very critical. It's linked to issues of royalty payments uh, where there has been more consideration to ensuring that there's protection for the uh, authors, for performers, and in this case for authors and ensuring that usage is, 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 is taken into consideration and there's no exploitation for usage of works. And then there was um, a discussion around the gender neutral um, drafting uh, in terms of certain provisions where there was his or her uh, mentioned in the entire act, uh, both the performance protection and copyright, they were replaced by other words. Um, to, they were changed to them, uh, their or theirs, for example. So gender, gender neutral amendments were considered. Um, they did not necessarily, did not, they did not form part of um, what the public raised, but they, they, they were raised in the committee by um, the member uh, who was concerned about that. And then the committee took that into consideration. So in terms of examples of areas where such were taken into account is clause 11, which I was speaking to around royalties regarding sound recordings um, in computer programs, clause 21, this, there was the, there's an area where his or her was changed. Um, so for example, the changes would be along those lines. They're not exhaustive, it's just examples of where such gender neutral drafting examples are located in the, in the bill. And then uh, the next um, set clause is clause 12. Um, it's, 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 a, it's about the dig digital rights. Uh, and, and these were, they, they form part of the deliberations in the committee in terms of proposals made to align with the treaty, the WIPO copyright treaty. Uh, there were proposals to um, have digital rights for published editions and for computer programs. So to have um, making the work available by wire or wireless means and communicating the work to the public by wire or wireless means for both public editions and computer programs. So these changes were incorporated. So they, they now form part of the amendment bill to strengthen the, the, the bill and also to ensure that there's alignment to the uh, international treaty, in this particular instance, the WIPO Copyright Treaty. The next um, clause is clause 15. Uh, this clause uh, addresses the issue of fair use and related um, uh, exceptions. So it provides for the general exceptions uh, from copyright protection for all works, um, providing for fair use, which is a model of use of work or the performance and includes, it includes factors uh, of usage to consider to ensure the usage of work is fair. For example, the, the substantiality of the work, the purpose of the work, um, and also there are examples of usages of fair use. Um, so it has a list of possible usages from research uh, and, and so on. So the, this is the general provision. Um, the change that was made there uh, was in uh, subsection 12 AC in respect of the name of the author for both A and B, um, which looks at the different aspect of the general exception. It, it provides that the name of the author should be mentioned if it appears on the work. And uh, the word and was changed to read as, as well as. And also if it appears on the work was added on the subsection. So as I've indicated, some of the changes are very technical. So these are very slight changes after the deliberations and the public uh, discussions around fair use as one of the reservations that were raised by the president. And in the next, in the slide, in the slide and the next ones, I'll speak to some of the technical changes that were introduced based on the deliberations. With the exceptions, there's been a general concern that with the way the, the bill is drafted, the exceptions are too wide. They give too much scope and rights to users and not so much protection for authors and copyright owners. So there's always been a debate in terms of how wide do you make the exceptions or how restrictive do you make the exceptions? 
And in that case, um, part of the processes of the deliberations and the amendments were to ensure there's more controls, there's more defined standards of usage uh, to also assist in terms of further issues that may arise in terms of disputes, uh, in terms of measurement of usage. So um, clause 15 also looks at section 12B, which the, president's, uh, the president in his letter highlighted. So in terms of section uh, 12B, uh, it's, it's about specific exceptions from copyright protection applicable to all works. Um, and in this particular instance, one will zoom into the issue of quotations and illustrations. So section 12B1A, um, the following amendments were made on the quotations. So the name of the author uh, is to be mentioned if it appears on the work. So there's a change that was made. There was a word practicable in respect of uh, Roman figure two. And um, so the, that was removed. And also uh, consideration was made to include extent justified by the purpose and fair practice. So in this part, in the quotations, both fair practice and extent justified by the purpose um, will be incorporated in this um, and in this section. Um, and then the issue around as far as practicable will not be considered was not considered in this in this uh, subset in this provision, uh, and not to be yeah and 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 so in this particular it was not considered. And then uh, consideration was also made in 12B1B uh, B, in terms of the illustrations to say that illustrations are more applicable for uh, teaching and education. So they should move to the exception that deals with education. So this was moved to the next section. And then there was also, a, there's an amendment in 12B1 subsection D in respect of the name of the author to add if it appears on the work. Um, the intention is to recognize the author and to ensure that when the name appears on the work, it is um, acknowledged. Then moving along to section 12B1, uh, subsection D. This um, initially, this is, is it was it was initially uh, 12B1E. The numbering had to adjust. Um, it, it it focuses on the current events exception. Um, it was recommended that as far as practic uh, uh, as far as practicable be excluded from the the bill it was removed um, and that the author the name of the author to be included if it appears on the work be included in the subsection and uh, the committee initially agreed to remove section 12 ei which was in the uh, on the list of the issues raised by the president so this was deleted because it's already it's also covered in section 12a in terms of uh, current events uh, reporting and then the extent justified by the purpose is the only um, measurement of standard used in terms of this exception um, and then there was a correction in the introduction uh, where um, for purposes of providing current information um, was was corrected. And also uh, the issue of the extent justified by the purpose um, is, is retained in this, um, in this current events uh, exception. Then we'll go to the translation exception. So in the translation, there was a wording that was tweaked. Um, the wording was changed the, uh, to read non-commercial purposes. Initially, it was not for commercial purposes. And furthermore, based on the deliberations, there was language and culture added to the translation provision. And fair practice in terms of um, the fairness of the use of the work was retained for translations. Um, there, were, there was a, a slight technical amendment in terms of the use of and instead of all, because all is like optional in terms of the areas listed on the translation uh, provision. So and was incorporated to ensure that all of those listed are inclusive, they are all required. And then in terms of the personal copies exceptions, um, it was based on the deliberations and the advice from the public, fair practice is included in the bill. Um, and then there was a consideration not to include extent justified by the purpose. 
And then the word individual was substituted with the natural person. And then the, the suggestion to have different time or different device um, was not considered in the subsection, but is retained in uh, subsection 12A uh, where there is fair use. Then 12C, 12C provides for the permission to make trans, trans, transient or incidental copies of a work, including reformatting an integral and essential part of the technical process. Um, there was a wedding uh, layout issue there that needed to be corrected. And the provision was retained with a slight amendment of removing the word independent economic significance to read as commercial significance. Then the education uh, exception, um, which provides for educational and academic activities. The changes that ultimately were finalized were not substantive, but it was around the measurement of usage and controls. So section 12D8A, um, it includes as far as practicable, uh, because this subsection is not an exception that is contained in the act, but a new one. So as far as is practicable, is currently included there. And also what was added is that the name um, can be mentioned where it appears and where it is possible. Um, for 12D, both fair practice and extent justified by purpose were included in terms of um, subsection 12.8B. And also for subsection 12D9, both fair practice and extent justified by the purpose are included. And um, the deletion was made of um, if it, where it talks to the name, if it appears in the work on, and only on was retained. So it used to read as if it appears on or in the work. So uh, on was retained, in was removed. So you can see the technicalities around it, but these are not really um, substantive uh, changes. And then in terms of the next provision that was already in the bill, it's, it's called the freedom of panorama. It's general exceptions from protection of artistic works. So clause 16 of the bill proposed an amendment to section 15 of the act to provide for general exceptions from protection of artistic works and incidental use exceptions. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this case, for instance, um, certain acts um, currently can be seen as infringement. For instance, if you take a, a, a statue um, say in parliament, you take a statue with your picture and then you post it on Facebook, for example. So this exception provides for usages that are incidental uh, of such nature without them being an infringement of, of usage. The next provision is clause 21 of the bill that proposes an amendment to section 19B of the act by providing that the person having a right to use a copy of a computer program shall be entitled without the authorization of the copyright owner to observe, study, or test the functioning of the program in order to determine the ideas and principles which underline any element of the program. If he or she does so while performing any of the acts of loading, displaying, running, transmitting, or storing the program, which he, so the, the, the pardon the he or she, uh, because of the gender, gender neutral, they will, it will be them or it, 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 it's been amended. So, but then the, the point being about how computer programs are addressed from um, an exception perspective and how they are used and considerations around them. So in terms of 19C, which is clause 22, um, there were discussions around this as well. 19C provides general exceptions regarding protection of copyright work for libraries, archives, museums, and galleries. So deliberations were around section 19C4, where there were issues raised around the usage of this, and it was part of the reservations by the president. There were concerns raised with the use of the word commercial when reading section 19C1 with uh, 19C subsection 4. Uh, so this sections, they outlines activities that can be permitted for access, education, educational or research purposes. Um, based on the deliberations, the section was retained as is, as is with commercial purposes. So commercial purposes, of what the wording was retained there in terms of the uses as provided for in that particular uh, subsection. 
And I'm going to move now to the uh, clause 22 uh, on the persons uh, with disabilities. Um, this provides general exceptions regarding protection of copyright work for persons with disability. Um, so several amendments were made to align the provisions to the Marrakesh Treaty, um, it, uh, where we talk about the authorized entities, there are cross-border requirements in terms of exporting, imp ex importing the, the, the works or accessible format copies. So changes were made in this uh, section that are um, to some extent substantive, but they um, ensured alignment to the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, so the authorized entity was added. So section 19D1B is aligned to the treaty language regarding the integrity of the work that they, the work, the integrity of the work must be maintained. Um, there are sections where the authorized entity is added uh, in section subsection two and three. And also there were concerns about the burden of proof and um, in, in terms of the usage of the, uh, where there are issues around the way that the, the, the works are being used and um, in terms of the burden of liability around that. So the wording was amended there to look at um, reason to know, um, is just to ensure the alignment with the treaty language. And the issue of the name um, was also considered if it appears on the work. There was, as far as practicable before, it was removed. And um, there were references to a person using the word that and they were amended to who. So these are, these are some of the changes that were, that came about from the deliberations. Plus 23 of the CAB provides, it provides for an author to have the right to blame authorship of the work and to object to any distortion, mutilation or other modification of the work where such action is or would be prejudicial prejudicial to the honor of reputation of the author. Um, the clause further provides that the author shall be deemed to have the right to take legal action related to the infringement of the provision of this section on moral rights. So this section deals with the way that author has a right to be represented in the work um, without any distortion or manipulation and not in line with the way they would prefer that their work be recognized. So it's about the moral right of the, the work and the author. The next clause is clause 24 of the bill. It proposes an amendment to section 21 of the act to provide for the ownership of any copyright subsisting in the work between the person commissioning the work and the author who executes the commission to be governed by a written agreement. There are works that are commissioned. They can include photographs, they can include paintings, audiovisual works. And so this section or this clause provides how the commissioning relationship should be governed. And it addresses the issue of the use of the contract or the written agreement. And also there's additional protection provided uh, through the tribunal on how the work must be used. For instance, when the work is not used by the person uh, who commissioned it for purpose it was, it was commissioned. Um, where the work is used for the, uh, other than what it was commissioned for. And when the work is of a personal nature, how it should be treated. And also um, how they, when considered the, the license, um, how to consider the license when the work is not used by the person who commissioned. So there, there's a big role for the tribunal here in terms of um, ensuring that factors are taken into consideration on how commissioned work must be considered. And then there's also work um, around the clause on assignment of literary or musical work. So clause 25 of the bill proposes an amendment to section 22 of the act by providing that copyright owned by vesting in or under the custody of the state may not be assigned. Um, what is owned by government or the state should not be assigned. Also, it provides a, re a re reversion right for where copyright in a literary or musical work was assigned by an author. Uh, it will only be valid for a number of years, in this case, 25 years from the date of such an, um, an assignment. 
and that the agreement in that regard uh, can be both verbal or in writing. Um, in terms of license works, um, sort of often works, uh, clause 26 of the bill proposes the insertion into the act of a new section 22A, making provision for licenses in respect of often works. Um, is, is, is it's mechanism or procedure on how to deal with often works and how often works should be applied um, and also often works for the resale royalty rights for the original works of art. So it just sets out the procedure when you can't find the author, when you can locate the author, what are the steps in order to use that works and, and, and procedure by the regulator, which is CIPC. Uh, one of the big amendments in the, in the bill is the, uh, it's around the collecting societies uh, in terms of accreditation, administration, regulation of the collecting societies. So this is, uh, forms part of the recommendation of the Copyright Review Commission, uh, how the whole collecting society um, regime should be addressed in the, in the bill. So there's a chapter that has been inserted into the act for the accreditation uh, that includes the issues of transformation, administration, regulation. Um, and also it has got strong um, offenses in terms of things that must not be done intentionally uh, in terms of the collecting society. Um, and also uh, provisions are made for the transitional arrangements for, ad for those uh, collecting societies that are not accredited currently and the procedures that will be followed, how the collecting society must deal with issues of royalties um, and, 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 and the control of the collecting societies by the authors, performers, the copyright owners. So it's just a, a big amendment that deals with different issues related to uh, collecting societies. And as the uh, honorable members may recall, there was a time there were lots of issues around the governance of collecting societies, the tensions around issues of membership, um, payments of royalties and so on. So there is a gap legislatively on the governance of these collecting societies. And furthermore, this clause provides for the suspension, cancellation, uh, accreditation of these collecting societies. So it's a very big amendment. So moving on to clause 28 of the bill that proposed an amendment to section 23 of the act by providing for an offense if a person tampers with information managing copyright or abuses copyright and technological protection measures. So this are, is information related to um, copyright management information linked to technological protection measures. So. Um, there are offenses linked to how the information is abused or mis mismanaged. And clause 29 of the bill proposes an amendment to section 27 of the act by inserting a new subsection which provides for an offense if a person unlawfully circumvents technological protection measures applied by the author or copyright owner. It also provides for penalties where the convicted person is not a natural person. In terms of clause 29, um, there's a section that has been um, inserted, uh, section 27.5a. It provides for offenses in respect of uh, communicating and making available the work to the public by wire or wireless means. Uh, there, are, there are some changes that have been made in terms of these provisions, uh, this provision. For example, in the original bill, there was a reference to owner um, so the reference was removed. So the owner could have authorized another person to give authority. So necessary authority is all that is required. And because of the serious nature of some of the breaches that are not for commercial purposes, it was recommended that in terms of the offenses, both um, offenses made for commercial and non-commercial um, purposes be taken into account. Um, this. Uh, provision uh, relates to exploitation and issues of piracy where copyright works are circulated in social media on the internet without infringing the rights of the copyright owners and authors without um, proper permission and this infringement. So this is one of the measures in the bill that is meant to deter um, abuse of copyright works by 
uh, users so any person who might infringe the use of, of copyright in a manner that was not intended. And um, one of the considerations is that the person who does so must have known that they're doing so. Uh, so in offense is um, only intent constitute an offense. Um, so when the person knew what they were doing, when they were circulating, uh, or it had implications because of their knowledge. Uh, so that's when it can be an offense. So the words or has reason to believe were removed from the section. So the person must know. And then there was a numbering issue uh, from the uh, provisions that were advertised. So that has been addressed. And also there's, there's 5B and 5C that were added. Subsection 5B is offenses of infringing copyright with device or services. And 5C is offenses in respect of copyright management information. And in the same, um, context, we say that only intent constitutes an offense uh, and offenses in general. So meaning that the person must have known there should have been a knowledge of these offenses. And then there were changes that were required to be made related to the verbs in the, in the provision. And so these are the slight changes that were made in this, um, in this clauses. And then clause 31, uh, provides for prohibited conduct in respect of technological protection measures. So in section 28.0, there was the word service added to read as technological protection measure device or service. And then there was um, removal of reference to the Electronic Communications and Transaction Act, uh, which was, um, yeah, agreed to be removed. So in section 28.P, uh, which provides for exceptions in respect of technological protection measures. There was also removal of the, the ECTA Act, Electronic Communications and Transaction Act, and also the reference to regulations were made under the Act, included in the section. So meaning that permit, permitted acts, um, they, they, there's a regulation they, that they can be um, prescribed. And on section, on clause 31, furthermore, uh, there was a correction that was made of numbering. It had uh, two subsections uh, with a similar number. And then the Copyright Tribunal, as recommended by the Copyright Review Commission, is one of the major amendments as well. Um, clause 32 and 33 of the bill amend Section 29 and proposes the insertion of Section 29A to 29H into the act, which provide for amongst others, the strengthening of the copyright tribunal, its functions, appointment of its members, term of office, removal and suspensions and procedural matters on the conduct of the hearings of the tribunal. So it's the whole governance, uh, um, strengthening of the tribunal, uh, its functions, its hearings. So practical application of how the tribunal will be dealt with. Clause 35, it's on the regulations. Clause 35 of the bill proposes an amendment to section 39 of the act by providing for ministerial powers to prescribe regulations relating amongst others to the procedure for the conduct of tribunal hearings and relating to collecting society as well as prescribing minimum standards for contracts. And furthermore, there were some corrections that were made um, supported or informed also by the public participation process. Um, so there was a correction to CH to read at S28P. It was 28B uh, and, and, and in that regard, 28B did not exist. Um, in terms of section 39, subsection three, there was there were a, a consideration for regulations recognizing entities in respect of persons with disability and then consequential amendment to include regulation in subsection two in respect of person with, uh, persons with disability. Also very important for the protection in the bill is the un un an unenforceable contract. So clause 36 of the bill proposes a new section, the 9B, and provides that a term in a contract that purports to prevent or restrict any act which by virtue of the act will not infringe copyright or which purports to renounce a right of protection afforded by the act will not be enforceable. So there are rights that are provided for by the act. 
So a contract should not deviate from such rights. And also uh, it should not renounce the rights that have been provided for by the act. So such a contract, if it's found to have been made in not good faith and um, against the rights of those who are participating in that contract can be regarded as an, an unenforceable contract as per the, as per the bill. And the, this is, this was considered as additional protection for unfair contractual terms where contracts are used not as a not in a positive manner but to disadvantage those who are not as um, aware or who do not know their rights in terms of contracting. So this is meant to also create a, an enabling environment for contracting in terms of this uh, piece of legislation. So clause 37 of the bill proposes the insertion into the act of a new schedule two. The schedule two provides for translation licenses and reproduction licenses. And also clause 38 provides for the amendment of the expressions. So we used to have cinematograph film and film in the, in the, in the act. They will be replaced by audiovisual work and work uh, respectively. And then the transitional provisions are provided for in clause 39. Um, so this relates to the uh, issues that are linked to the Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act um, in terms of ensuring that certain provisions will only become effective once this law um, comes into effect. And then the last one is clause 40 of the bill that provides for the short title and commencement of the bill. So this is the last provision in the Copyright Amendment Bill. In conclusion, as far as the Copyright Amendment Bill is concerned, from the observation and participation of the department, we are of the view that the President's reservations were considered in detail. Also from the experience of what we observed was that many provisions were considered, however, due to their substantive nature and potential unintended consequences, the, con the changes could not be made. Some of them require further research and policy consultations. For example, on the technological protection measures definition, um, the definition of broadcast, um, the ephemeral exceptions that deals with issues of uh, uh, the sound recordings and the broadcasting uh, records, uh, issues of royalties around that, um, that, that usage or exception. And then the personal use provision that was proposed around the definition of lawfully acquired. Um, there was an experience that we ex was exchange or observation from the UK around a similar definition. So some, most of them were deliberated, but because of some of the, the, the potential implications they were not um, incorporated in the, in the amendment bill. Um, what could be said about the, your extent justified by the purpose, uh, your fair practice um, measurements, um, issues around your, as far as practicable, the name of the author, is that more alignments were made on these measurements of control of the usage of exceptions, meaning that the concern of the president that the exceptions, uh, or the concern of the public as well, that some of the exceptions are wide, was taken into serious consideration. There were efforts in terms of ensuring that they are tightened and there's more um, of such added into, the, um, into those exceptions. I'm gonna then move to the next uh, presentation, which is on the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. In terms of the Performance Protection Amendment Bill, uh, this is the objectives of the bill as taken from the, from the bill itself. The bill provides for the performance economic rights. It also extends the moral rights of the performers um, in audiovisual fixations. This is the rights of, um, of their image, uh, not to be distorted or mutilated, but to be represented as, as it is. Uh, to provide for the transfer of rights where a performer consents to uh, fixation of a performance, uh, to provide for the protection of rights of producers of sound recordings, to broaden the restriction on the use of performances, 
to extend the application of restrictions on the use of performances to audiovisual fixations, to provide for royalties or equitable remuneration to be payable when a performance is sold or rented out, uh, to provide for recorder and reporting of certain acts and to provide for an offense in relation to that too, and also to provide for the minister to be able to prescribe a compulsory standard uh, of contractual terms, as well as guidelines for performers to, um, to, to, to be able to grant consent under this act, to provide for prohibited conduct and exceptions in, in respect to technological protection measures, and copyright management information. Some of the provisions in the Copyright Amendment Bill are similar to the Performance Protection Amendment Bill. Um, as performance protection is a neighboring right to the, the Copyright, um, copyright um, and also to the Copyright Amendment Bill. So the, there's a close link between the two uh, uh, bills. So some of the issues you'll find that I've already highlighted them, but from the copyright uh, copyright perspective, for example, the issue of the technological protection measures. So they are those. There is an alignment between the two uh, pieces of uh, of legislation, including the definitions and so on. So likewise, to the copyright amendment bill, we have clause one of the definitions. Um, it's um, audiovisual fixation the definition of um, broadcast communication to the public, what that means, copyright management information, what does performance mean? What does a performer mean? What is a producer reproduction? What is a sound recording? What is a technologically protected work um, and technological protection measure and technological protection measure circumvention device? So these definitions, especially around the technological protection measures are similar to the ones in the in the copyright um, amendment amendment bill. Um, and also the deletion of the definition of cinematograph film uh, fixation, phonograph, and by the substitution for the definition of broadcast uh, performer and reproduction. Clause two of the bill proposes the substitution of section three of the principal act. The primary objective of this clause is to clearly uh, circumscribe the statutory rights of conferred upon a performer in particular certain exclusive rights in respect of his or her performances. So it's about the the image of the of the performer, their moral rights, how their works should be or their performance should be um, addressed. And then there's trans, uh, clause three that deals with the transfer of rights. Um, Clause three proposes the insertion of section 3A to provide for the transfer of rights where the performer has consented to uh, fixation of his or her, of, of her performance in an audiovisual fixation or sound recordings, um, which is subject to a written agreement which shall give the performer the right to receive royalties or equitable remuneration for any use of the performance. It is proposed that the exercise of the right in respect of sound recording shall be valid for a period of 25 years from the date of commencement of the agreement and where after the rights reverse to the performer. Um, in terms of the deliberations, recent deliberations, there was a need to distinguish the remunerations of the performers in relation to audiovisual works and sound recordings um, between the issue of royalties and equitable remunerations. Um, so in terms of the royalties or equitable remuneration, it, it applies to audiovisual works and then equitable remuneration in respect of sound recordings. And then the, the issue of the gender neutral drafting has been factored in, in different um, provisions, including this one on the transfer of rights. Clause three also uh, focuses on the protection of rights of producers of sound recordings. So it also grants exclusive rights to the producer of a sound recording that includes the right to reproduce and making available to the public. The clause also provides the right to earn an equal remuneration subject to the contract in to the contract uh, for the direct or indirect use of sound recording to the performer, composer and producer of sound recording published for commercial purposes for broadcasting or communication to the public. So this talks to the rights that the producers of sound recordings have. And then clause four of the bill proposes um, 
an amendment to section five of the principal act to provide for the consent of the performer for an unfixed performance um, or, or a performance fixed in an audiovisual fixation or sound recording. It provides for availability of the original and copies of performance fixed in audiovisual fixation to the public. So um, this provision aims to also ensure that there is proper usage of the performance um, works, whether it's live or fixed in a format of, let's say, uh, an example would be a recorded CD or um, a video um, and, and the manner that that work is being um, addressed. It also talks to the issue of the gender, gender neutral drafting. Furthermore, in clause four, there is also um, the provision for um, a person who intend to broadcast or communicate the work to the public uh, and, and how that should be addressed and the recorder of that work. So the work that is being used in the public must be recorded for, for to ensure that there is that payment of those royalties. So failure to do so constitutes an offense. Um, and also there's uh, issues around penalties and fines uh, on the um, where they, they, this, is, this is not followed accordingly. And, and it also provides for the performer to receive royalties or equitable remuneration uh, for authorizing the fixation of the audiovisual work or sound recording for performing certain acts provided in the agreement with the producer of that fixation. And then in clause five, there is a proposal, a proposed amendment to insert section eight of the, in the act and provides for situations where audiovisual fixation or, or, or sound recording can be used without consent. For instance, that include private study. So these are exceptions where there could be free, free use, free use of the of the exceptions. I mean, oh, sorry, of the of the works, so of the performance. So this there is provision for that as well in the in the performance protection amendment bill. So the clause provides for the acts the broadcaster can perform without consent um, that is required in this uh, in section five. But where the performer has consented, it also. Uh, provides for gender neutral drafting. And then clause six of the bill empowers the minister to make regulations regarding compulsory and standard contractual terms, as well as to provide guidelines to performers when granting consent. And then there was a correction of a, uh, a typographical error uh, where uh, the word into was added. Um, it was missing in the, in the, in the reading of the wording. And clause seven and eight of the P of the bill proposes the, the, it proposes the insertion of sections uh, eight E, F, G, and eight A to provide for the prohibited conduct in relation to uh, technological protection measures, which is aligned with the sections um, twenty eight O P of the Copyright Act. Uh, so these are the sections I, I indicated are similar in terms of their alignment. And, um, and the, the alignments of the TPM related provisions. So for clause seven, the reference to the electronic communications and transaction act was made. And also in section eight E and section eight F. And then the gender neutral drafting was also taken into, into consideration in this, um, in this, in this provision. Um, And then the clause nine, it substitutes the expressions phonograph to sound recording and fixation to a sound recording when, wherever they appear in the act. And then the transitional provisions, um, clause 10 provides for the transitional provisions. And then there's a short title um, for the short title of the bill and the, and the commencement. And just to add in, in clause two, there are these exclusive rights that are also added. I'm going back a bit, sorry about that. The exclusive rights, um, they include um, um, the broadcasting and communication to the public of their unfixed performances, the fixation of their unfixed performances in an audiovisual fixation. So basically there are 
economic rights that have been provided in the bill, in the performance protection amendment bill for, for performance in a more structured manner to also enable them to exploit their economic rights. So this goes back to clause two, but just to add that there are these um, exclusive rights that uh, are, are relevant for the performers um, in their performances, uh, whether fixated or unfixed. Uh, Chair, this is the this was the last slide. I just added that part. Um, I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if uh, the DM wants to make some comments before I allow honorable members to ask questions. Sir President, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, now, Chair, that uh, would constitute the, the totality of the, our presentation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make any additions at this stage. We, we, we promise that it will be a very long presentation, as yeah. you can see. Yes. yes, thanks. Otherwise, thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, uh, DM and uh, DDG. Uh, honorable members, I'm trying to, to check uh, the list of uh, uh, members who are connected. Are there any questions uh, on the two bills, uh, honorable members? Can you help me, uh, Ms. Monty, if there are any hands? Um, yes, Shri. Um, at present, I don't see any hands, Shri. Oh, okay. So maybe it was clear. Uh, can, I, can I just check um, uh, DDG on the issue of um, those issues that are still going to require uh, further research and uh, consultation? Uh, for example, you made mention of uh, that there will be further research and the, on the definition of broadcast. Uh, but I see in the copyright uh, uh, amendment bill there is a definition already uh, on, on the bill. Uh, so what does that mean when you say then there's going to be? Because it's not now deleted uh, in the definition uh, for purposes of uh, further. Uh, uh, consultation and research, uh, but it's already defined uh, in, in the bill itself, but it's one of the items uh, that are still going to be subjected to further research and uh, and, 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 and consultation. Um, uh, Honorable Mwima. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me uh, also express uh, uh, an appreciation from the from uh, the uh, presentation uh, just two just two two areas that I want to to, to be clarified on share I think the, the, the first the first one relates to a point that was raised that uh, uh, I think it's in relation to a provision of section 12. You, uh, one of the points that was raised was that there are amendments that were made, if I'm not mistaken, that were made beyond the beyond the reservations that were expressed by the president. Uh, and uh, the question that I want to 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 to, to, to be clarified on is: uh, Can those errors be 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 flagged for us so that we are uh, we are uh, 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 sensitized around them? And and secondly, uh, uh, the, whether these those amendments were they put to the uh, public consultation? Were they subject matter of public consultation or uh, were they brought uh, uh, as part and parcel of the of, of, of the of the consultative process? Uh, the the second the second point is the the issues around I think it's 
1639 Public Stadium. The point was raised around the, the, the standard contract that was introduced, that was introduced in the bill. Uh, and uh, earlier on, a point was raised around the freedom, freedom to contract. Uh, if, 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 if the, the, the amendment uh, to the act uh, does introduce a, 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 a type of a pro forma contract, uh, what does that uh, uh, do to the point that was raised earlier on around the freedom to contract? Uh, uh, but, 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 but other than that, I think the I think the, the issue of the taking I agree it was it was, it was quite important that the, the taking the taking uh, the the section seventy six uh, of course mindful of the fact that uh, uh, trade is not a concurrent function, but maybe if if one could just be clarified in terms of uh, what could have uh, also led to the other than culture and tradition, uh, which I suspect could be the reason behind, but that the issue of trade, uh, I thought that is not a concurrent function. Uh, but, but, but other 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 than that, the there's also a last point that was made around the socioeconomic impact of the of the bill. If, if the team can just share with us the, uh, the, the that study that was done so that at least uh, one get a sense around the, the I believe the the politics behind the the two the uh, the, the, the two amendments uh, 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 of course mindful of the of the point that was raised uh, in the workshop that we had around uh, the, the the systemic nature of the challenges that we faced. By the by the performers, but also uh, uh, the need to ensure that uh, there is a, uh, a protection of, uh, of, of, of intellectual uh, property rights uh, across all the the various players, whether it is the author, whether it is the performer, whether it is the scriptwriter. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Let me let me pause there. Sorry, sir. I was just checking my constitution, especially on schedule four, because um, remember so that raising about trade. Just wanted to check it on the uh, schedule uh, four, because uh, it's one of the issues that was mentioned as uh, 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 that it, uh, that uh, provinces have a role uh, with regard to that. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I just wanted to, um, because my, my, my understanding and also the advice uh, is that uh, because now the, the, the bills have been retagged as uh, Section 76, the possibility is that it, it means, therefore, uh, the, the committee and uh, the provinces are, are not bound uh, by the reservations of uh, uh, the president, um, because now they are the, the entire bill uh, is, is subject to the the legislative process, which include uh, the committee uh, work, uh, the provinces, the public uh, uh, involvement or uh, public hearings and public submissions. My 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 question, therefore, is what then if uh, the the, the public uh, comes back on the same issues uh, and convince the, the legislatures and also the committee, for example, on the issue of the fair use, uh, that uh, is one of uh, the areas where the president has a reservation on, and the, the, the issue of the respectivity. Uh, what happened with regard to this? Because uh, now the, the, the whole bills uh, entirely uh, will be subject to the law uh, making processes. Uh, there will be submissions uh, that uh, committee and uh, legislators must uh, consider, and they could come back as part of the negotiating mandates or even final mandates uh, of uh, of uh, the provincial legislatures. Um, yeah, maybe can can we get then responses? 
if there are no further uh, questions for clarity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I request uh, not to open the video again, if, it, if that is okay with Chair. It's okay, though the, uh, there's no indication of uh, uh, challenges of uh, connectivity. <laughs> <laughs> it's white there. I, I was uh, educated that it's white there. The, the track is fine. When it's uh, yellow, then there's a likelihood. But then when it's red, you can be <laughs> kicked out. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for right. that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the indulgence. Much appreciated. Um, thank you. In terms of the the, 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 the point, uh, the question that the Chair raised about the broadcast, Chair is correct. Uh, broadcast was in the in the bill. Um, there the was broadcast before. Um, so what has happened, um, there were comments that were made, especially from, I think all the broadcast came back from a treaties perspective, where there was a debate about the use of wire or wireless means. And because of the wire and wireless means, the, the debate, the issue then became uh, critical for further deliberations on whether to remove wire. So the recommendation was that to align to one of the treaties, wire must be removed and we are left only with wireless. But then the deliberations talk to the implications of what that means in the South African context when you remove wire. So it, 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 it came about from a treaty implication perspective, but you are right here, there was a definition before uh, but then there was also a need to ensure that the definition is also incorporated in both bills, copyright and performance protection. So some of the issues um, raised were, um, were, were related to existing uh, provisions uh, where there was a need to align to a treaty or to improve a particular uh, provision where there were issues raised. So that's where this came from, uh, but it was already there. But then the issue of wire wireless is what brought it back to the, the focus of the discussions. So um, it, this ties up also to the question by Mr. Mumang related to the uh, issues of issues that went beyond the reservations. I raised that point because the there was there were the, the members of the public who were of the view that the amendments or the proposed changes went beyond the president uh, reservation because the president listed particular subsections and provisions in his reservation letter but then um on the implications of the treaties i'll use an example of the uh digital rights for the public editions and uh, computer programs. They were not on the list that the president provided. However, they have treaty implications. So from the uh, um, WIPO Copyright Treaty, you have uh, the public, uh, 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 digital rights for computer programs and for public editions. So the public said, let's include them and to, so that we update the legislation and take that into account. So the point I was trying to make was that in our view, there were no issues that went beyond what the president pro provided. He also said, we need to ensure our obligations in terms of international treaties alignment. Uh, and he was not specific to say, look at uh, broadcast wire wireless. He was not specific. So the public assisted, the experts and the public assisted to identify those areas that needed to be aligned to the treaties. That's where we think that those issues came in. So I raised it because we are going to into another public participation process um, uh, just to highlight where the changes were coming from. So that was where, this is the context of where that was coming from. To say some of the issues came about when we also looked at the international treaty implications. For instance, in the Marrakesh Treaty, there were things that the president did not raise the definition of authorized entity, but because of alignment to the Marrakesh Treaty, the authorized entity is incorporated in the amendments now. And it was also put forward to the public for further uh, consideration. And then the other issue of the, the standard contractual uh, terms versus the freedom of contract. Um, and I, I like the honorable members emphasis on the performer, like a guideline or some kind of an indication. Um, 
the thinking here is not to is not to interfere with contractual rights of on, copyright owners, authors, and uh, uh, the, the, the the producers and so on. The reason why this issue came up strongly is because of the historical context we have in South Africa, where unfair contracts were part of the system. And from our understanding, that situation is still happening today. So you have someone who is a new uh, creator, a new uh, artist or a new musician or a new actor, actress. They don't know what to expect when it comes to a contract. So whatever they're given, they can even sign their rights away. They don't know what a contract should indicate. How much are you going to be paid? What is the term of the contract? Is there an exit clause in your contract? It's just a standard to say, when you do a contract, there are considerations you should have in mind. So it's not to dictate actual contractual arrangements between persons, but the emphasis is to say, as a policy issue, the issue of contractual arrangements and fair contractual practices came about very strongly. And it's a historical context. I mean, from time to time, you open the Sunday Times, you hear about a very prominent uh, musician, a prominent uh, actor or actress who's saying, I lost so much, I did so much, but then the contract said everything was signed away to so-and-so and and they're making money, I'm not making anything. So it's our challenge that we thought that this issue deserves a specific emphasis, but not to dictate, but to just um, draw out, uh, set out the enabling environment. It's like uh, creating a playing field around issues of contract. Uh, what happens between parties is confidential, is between them, uh, government does not get involved, but the government can set the tone, it can create a framework, so the, the person must know, I need to know about my rights, uh, the term of my contract, what rights do I have, when do I get a royalty, how is that determined, what is the rate of that, people must know such basic things, and then they can choose um, when they go out to negotiate what they choose to find themselves agreeing to. So that's where the, con- the content context is coming from. And the intention is not for this to tamper with the freedom of contracting. And in terms of the trade versus the, the Schedule 4, trade is one of the areas of concurrency in the Constitution as a Schedule 4 matter, likewise to cultural matters. So it was raised because trade affects all areas, I mean, the provinces, national. And so it's a con- concurrent area. It was raised in that context by the president also to say um, there is a need for the retaking, taking into account the issue of trade. So it is one of those areas that has led to this discussion. The socioeconomic impact study that I was referring to is an actual study that we outsourced to a service provider. The, there's also the socioeconomic that is dealt with by the the the, the presidency. Um, no but, matter. So what we will do from our side is to make available the the the, the studies that one is um, one was referring to, especially the core ones for the for the committee to have access to to those. Um, in terms of the, 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 the Section 76 implications and what happens if the public opens up the debates um, and, and, for instance, the issue of fair use and then it's it agreed that with, or there's a need to look at fair dealing again as is in the Act now and um, to, to reintroduce retrospectivity. Um, I, I think, Chair, on that one, I, I would say that is part of the public participation process. Um, as a department, um, there are policy positions that have been uh, considered, even um, outlined by the minister in his presentations in terms of how, how we look at fair use, in terms of the rights of, um, of, of consumers, users, and also the rights of the authors and the copyright owners and everyone involved. There's a way that we've come up with the policies around there to say this is where we are on fair uses, where we are on different areas. Of course, others were new issues over time that we needed to also adjust to in terms of where are we, given that the the, the bills evolved in terms of their term in the contract, in the parliament and so on. I would say, Chair, on the new 
um, directions. We will also be guided by the honorable members, will be guided by the chair uh, in terms of the approach that the the, 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 the NCOP would like to take on those key policy positions. Uh, from our side as the department, we will assess uh, issues as um, transparently, as independently, as objectively as we can. And where we are still of the view on certain policy positions, they will be put forward as they as they emerge. But then the, the final, final decisions around this will be dependent on the mandates of the provinces, will be dependent on the deliberations by the by the by the select committee. So there is openness in terms of the final, final bills, how they will look at the end of this process. So that is something that is still open based on the deliberations that are going to come, the public participation, the views of the select committee. And yeah, that's that, that's how Pfizer can answer. It is a very difficult question, I must say, because there is a way the bills are right now. There is a way we look at policy from our side, but yes, still an open process. There could be changes that are considered. There could be things that are reintroduced, and that will also depend on how the committee then looks at the issues. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ansers. Honorable uh, Moimang, I did check uh, the uh, yes, trade is a uh, part of uh, uh, the functional areas uh, of concurrent national and uh, provincial uh, legislative legislative uh, uh, con um, competence. So, yeah, it was also on those bases that it was rejected as Section 76. Um, let, let me just check then if uh, again, if there are any other members would like to uh, make follow up questions. If not, can I uh, ask if uh, uh, there are any comments from uh, uh, Advocate? Uh, Fanny Merve, uh, also from the procedural point of view, if uh, Shamira would like to also make comments. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I wonder if I should comment now. I am going to be speaking a little bit about tagging in my presentation that will follow. Um, and I think some of um, you know the points that were raised um, might come up in, in my presentation so that I don't duplicate. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Let's start then with uh, Shamara, if uh, uh, she has any uh, points to raise. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, the only thing that I have to say, Chairperson, is with regards to the submissions that would come from the public, um, in terms of when the department has indicated that further research and um, we would need to look into those aspects, um, it will all depend on whether the legislatures would agree with those amendments and then only will it come before um, the committee. So at the moment, whatever comes before the bill as, as its whole um, will serve before the committee um, and dependent on the proposals made during the public hearings and the negotiating mandates coming from the provinces, will the committee have to um, decide on those specific uh, issues? Thank you, Chairperson. Nothing further. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Masters, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to Ms. Ali uh, Shamara for the issue about research. I didn't respond to that question. On the research, um, further research work that was highlighted or areas that were highlighted having issues, um, I think the emphasis there on that conclude, con concluding slide was just to say there were areas that were identified in the deliberations that still requires possible further research. Some of the processes are locked in discussions, maybe say from an international perspective in terms of a treaty around say broadcasting, others depending depending on other departmental processes in other departments. So not all of them we are saying will do researches on them, but it was just to highlight that they were not dealt with in terms of amending further because of the way uh, gaps identified, whether there's further work needed or uh, there's a need for further engagement or policy debate and so on. That's where the context of research was coming from. So they had different context, uh, but they were identified. So it was just to make sure that they are brought forward and they are not, uh, they are mentioned somehow in this process. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Masters. Um, 
what we're going to do now is to uh, allow a um, advocate. Uh, there's a, there was a court case uh, that went to uh, the constitutional court. Uh, she's going to, at a high level, uh, take us uh, uh, through that. And um, after that, uh, we will then ask uh, uh, Honorable DM to make uh, closing remarks. Uh, but I must also indicate that uh, in the morning uh, during the workshop, because we wanted to accommodate uh, uh, the provincial legislatures in terms of the process, because um, some of them have uh, now joined the uh, uh, plenary sessions. We, the, there's a pro program that we've developed uh, with regard to the two bills, which we will, I won't, we won't be taking uh, uh, everyone through that now because we did that in the morning, uh, but we will share it uh, with the department um, that includes uh, uh, the briefings uh, to the provinces, uh, but that we will share uh, with, with, with the department so that they are aware uh, it goes up until uh, uh, May. Uh, next year, uh, in terms of uh, these uh, two, uh, two bills, I will be processing them. Let me now uh, hand over to uh, Advocate uh, uh, Fanemebe. Over to you, Advocate. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, if you would allow me to not do my video, um, I am going to go into load shedding in the next five minutes. Um, but um, I have switched over, so everything should be fine, but it says my internet connection isn't 100% stable. Um, but my presentation isn't long. Um, I want to just discuss with members the issue of, first of all, the Section 79.1 process. Now, it has been discussed to some extent uh, on various occasions by the chair, by DTI, so I won't to go too much into it. But maybe just to, to confirm with members that, um, and I said I will speak a little bit onto the tagging, so that's why I want to just, just pause on this one slide, um, that um, both these bills were classified as Section 75 bills. Now, it is a bit of a, a, a technical argument whether they affect cultural matters, because the bills in themselves are regulating a right. They are regulating the way in which that right can be um, explored, can be uh, used, can um, is protected, what are exceptions to that right. And because of that, strictly speaking, the bill should be, both bills should be classified as Section 75. And that is why it, they were, in fact, classified initially. However, the court um, in in the in an, in in the the Tongwani case said that if Parliament errs on the side of caution and rather uh, makes a bill a Section seventy six bill, then the Constitutional Court will not be able to criticize and find that bill unconstitutional or the process in which the bill was processed, unconstitutional. Now, we, we need to be cautious that we do not just make every bill a Section 76. There is a reason for Section 75 processing of legislation. It is part of the Constitution, and we need to be cautious um, and, and not just make everything a Section 76 before because we, we feel a little bit uncertain. But in this specific instance, and because these bills are so contentious, the, the content of these bills um, have, have, and you, you will see, the members will see when we start with the, the public participation process, there are so many views on the policies that, that are entrenched in these bills. And unfortunately, a very good way to attack a policy is to attack the, the parliamentary process. So because of that, and, and given this background to these bills, um, the Portfolio Committee decided that in this instance, they would rather err on the side of caution, and they requested the joint tagging mechanism to make both of these bills a Section 76. Now, the normally a section 75 bill is not considered by the national council of provinces 
unless it contains a, con a procedural concern that the assembly cannot correct or that only the council can correct. Uh, an, a, an example, for instance, was, um, I think it was the performing animals protection where there wasn't a quorum in the NCRP sitting. And therefore it's only the NCRP that could correct that. So that would be an example of something like that. But because these bills, even though there were section 75s when they were referred back, was then changed to a Section 76 bill. The rules, the joint rules dealing with Section 79.1 indicates that um, it must then be referred to the council. So in this um, instance, and, and I put it there in bold as my last bullet, the council must process the bill in accordance with the principle set out in Section 76. And you can only do that if you consider the totality of the bill as if it is a new bill referred to this council. So the select committee must almost see these bills as something that is before them the first time. You cannot be limited to the president's reservations because you now have to process this bill in terms of a new legislative process. So that is perhaps just on that. Um, and then just to, to explain to the committee what is expected of this committee um, in respect of the Section 79.1 process. So 79.1 deals with constitutional concerns that the president raises. In this case, it was constitutional uh, on a number of substantive matters as well. And I'll speak to that just now, but also in respect of the legislative process. So what is expected of this select committee and joint rule 209 is applicable. Now, first of all, you will see there that I wrote in blue that the committee cannot confine itself to the president's reservations because of the change in classification, the change in the legislative process. This committee may confer with the Portfolio Committee on Trade and Industry if there's any um, concern that the committee has or some questions that the committee has uh, or just discussions that the committee has. And then lastly, the committee must report on the president's reservations and if uh, the assembly passed an amended bill on the bill. Now, if the committee agrees with the president's reservations, and in this instance, the joint tagging mechanism sort of took that decision for this committee in that they said there should be a different legislative process. So, at this point in time, then the committee is, uh, recom uh, can recommend in a report how to, to correct that procedural defect. But in this instance, again, because the committee is doing a whole new legislative process, um, I would recommend that this can be done in its final report. However, um, your, your procedural advisors can consider this and, and then advise if an interim report is necessary. But I really think that it could be in a final report. And then of course, you must report whether you agree with the amended bill or recommend rejection of the bill. In this case, you may also amend that bill. Um, and here I will be very quick because uh, trade and industry really spoke to this quite uh, in detail. Um, so the first concern was respect of tagging that has been changed. They were both reclassified as section 76 bills. There was a concern about retrospective clauses an impermissible delegation of legislative power to the minister. These the Portfolio Committee agreed with, and these subsections have been removed from the Copyright Amendment Bill. And then the last three, lack of public participation in respect of fair use, which is now the new regime that is proposed in this bill in respect of exceptions. The fact that certain copyright exceptions may constitute deprivation of property and that others may violate the right to freedom of trade, occupation and profession, and lastly, compliance with international treaty implications. Now, in respect of treaty implications, this is not something that the president can refer a bill back on. However, because there was public participation the committee portfolio committee decided to consider all the reservations of the uh, president and accordingly international treaty uh, implications were also considered because that would then ensure because of, especially because this also affected your um, um, exceptions 
And because of that, the committee decided to consider all of these. And again, I will not go into the detail of the facilitation of public involvement. There was um, very extensive facilitation and there were amendments made. So that is just on the section 79 process. And then I want to just very high level discuss the matter of blind SA versus Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition um, with members. So what we have here is that the concern is that the current Copyright Act, so in other words, not the bill, the act itself was before the court. And the concern that was raised was that that act did not provide for people with visual and print disabilities. And it's very important to keep in mind that this case only dealt with visual and print disabilities. The bill, deals with a lot more. It deals with all types of disability and it provides some exception for all persons with any disability, not just visual and print disabilities. And this of course is because of the right to equality in our constitution. So although the Marrakesh Treaty speaks to visual and print disability, our constitution requires that the legislature considers equality rights. So if it affects one person with a, a certain type of disability, we must also provide for others because if, if the, um, the limitation would affect them the same way. But in this specific case, the court found that if we look at um, the sections of the Copyright Act that deal with authorization and exceptions to people who have a visual print disability, then these uh, sections are not uh, in, in compliance with the constitution. They are unconstitutional, they are invalid, and they are inconsistent um, with their rights. Specifically, to the, to the extent that these provisions limit the access of these persons to publish literary works and artistic works. So this was suspended for a period of 24 months. If this suspension lapses uh, September 2024, there is, in other words, still sufficient time because the bill is before the Selects Committee in this uh, period. And the Constitutional Court provided for a read-in measure pending the correction of this defect. Now, just to quickly go through the rights that the court indicated were affected, the first one was the right to equality. And, and perhaps while I go through these rights, members can also just, just think whether these rights would also be affected in respect of a person with a different type of disability, because that is what we will have to look at when we consider the bill. So the first one that the court spoke to was section 9.3, which says that the requirement of authorization um, is unfair discrimination. Just because there is a different format necessary for a work, um, and now you need to authorize someone to make that different format um, before you can use it, that is unfair discrimination in respect of someone with a disability. Section 10, which is the uh, section dealing with human dignity, um, the court found that those with print and visual disabilities are radically compromised in the access that they enjoy because of authorization being required. And that in itself places an indignity because of the difficult circumstances these people already face. Section 16, dealing with freedom of expression. And here the court says that your right to have freedom of expression, in other words, to utter something, also means that you need to be able to receive something. And if you cannot receive it, it impairs your freedom to impart information and therefore it affects the right to freedom of expression. Section 29, dealing with education. I think this one almost speaks for itself, but the court found that it affects the right to basic education as well as further, indica uh, further education. And the court indicated that there can be no doubt that the relaxation of the requirement of authorization is a reasonable measure that the state can and must take. And then lastly, cultural rights, because literary works are such an important source of cultural life. Um, the court indicated that if you cannot 
have a, a format made that is accessible to you because of the disability that you have, then you are compromised in your enjoyment of the right to participate in a cultural activity of your choice. Now, the remedy of the, the court was to prescribe measures um, oh, sorry, the, the court considered a number of, of measures. The first one was proposed that there could be regulations made. Now, uh, Section 13 speaks to certain regulations that can be made in respect of reproduction of works. But the court said that it doesn't mean that an accessible format copy is an exact reproduction of a work. There might be some adaptation, in other words, some change to the work. Now, this is not in respect of the content, of course, and you will see that the, the bill itself also says that we, we must still respect the integrity of the work. But it might be, and in fact, I have a very good example. When we advertised um, some of the changes that were proposed in the portfolio committee, we, we tried to have what we advertised transcribed into Braille. Now, I thought I was being very clever and I had some of the changes made into blue font because I thought it stood out very nicely. It's very easy for the public to see what the changes are. But of course, you cannot translate blue into Braille. You can, that blue color of the font cannot go into Braille. So we had to find a different way for those changes to be made clear in Braille. Now that is an adaptation. It is not, doesn't change the content, but the way in which it was presented had to be changed. So the court said that in other words, section 13, which allows for regulations on reproduction is not sufficient. The second thing that the, the court considered was clause 19D of the bill. Now this is something the committee will consider um, when we start talking about the bill itself. Now, first off, I started this um, talking about the judgments by, by stressing that the court only dealt with visual and print disabilities and, and clause 19D goes broader. Now, unfortunately, a court is limited to the facts before it. So the court cannot just by itself go broader. And because of that, the wording of clause 19 could not be used. That was the main reason. There was also something else. There's some, um, some requirements for regulations in uh, clause 19D. Now, uh, we will have to consider when, the, when we consider clause 19D, if, if um, the way that it's worded now in respect of regulations is sufficient to still address this, this um, judgment. But the court wanted a remedy that was available immediately. To say that the minister must go and make regulations would mean that there would still be a delay after the judgment. So that was also something that could not um, suit the court in respect of clause 19D. So what the court then did was to provide a read-in provision. Now I'm giving you the full read-in provision here, but I'm not going to read it out. When we go a little bit more in depth, I will do a comparison for you between the two. Um, what we are proposing is that, first of all, our office is of the view that clause 19D in fact does comply with the court order. There are some differences between the bill and the reading that relate to drafting practice. Some relate to policy proposed by the department. We must keep in mind that the committee does not have to accept the wording proposed by the court. What the court has done is to provide a remedy and the committee needs to look at that mischief that the court tried to um, remedy. And as long as the wording of the clause remedies the same mischief, but even if it is a very different remedy, then that will still be in order. Keep, we must keep in mind that the court is very cautious to recognize the legislature's right to make legislation. And the court does not want to prescribe, but where it is necessary for the court to give immediate relief, it will then sort of step a bit into the arena of the legislature and provide wording. But the court accepts that that wording is not necessarily the final way in which it must be worded. Of course, we must consider it. We must give serious consideration to it, and we will do that. But the committee must just keep in mind that it is not necessary 
to have it word for word. And I will, in fact, when I go into more depth, I will explain why certain of the words um, are, in fact, not suitable for the bill. For instance, um, the court used the Marrakesh word of beneficiary. But when we look at the bill, there are many beneficiaries. Marrakesh only dealt with people with visual and print uh, disability as beneficiaries, whereas the bill deals with many people who are beneficiaries in respect of an exception. There is there's an education exception, there's technology exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those are beneficiaries. So for instance, for our purposes, the word beneficiary will not work in the bill. Um, and therefore we use a person with a disability as, as a phrase. Also, our bill must go broader in that because we need to keep section nine of the constitution of equality in mind. And we must then uh, provide for other persons with different types of disabilities. So those are the other things to keep in mind. However, and this is why I'm saying that we must give serious consideration to what the court is, is, uh, has, has provided that read in. And our office is in fact taking it very seriously. We've already attended a workshop with Blind SA to hear what their views are on this. And we have made contact with a doctor, Samtani, who is advising Blind SA. And she has given us an undertaking to provide input on the wording of the bill by the end of November, 2022. Now we will be in, co in contact with her before then as well, but at that stage, we will then provide uh, feedback to the committee so that the committee can feel assured that either 19D is in fact sufficient, or if there are concerns that the committee is appraised exactly what those concerns are, what the possible, um, ways forward is in to address those concerns and then whether further amendments are required or not. So we will definitely do all of that for the committee. Uh, and Chair, thank you. That is that is my presentation on these two matters. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Advocate Fanameva. Uh, honorable members, can we make inputs on the first and second uh, uh, inputs. I think the next one because uh, it's high level, but we'll be getting details uh, as we indicated in the workshop uh, sometime in November. Are there any questions? <clears throat> well, just a question uh, from me on the second one, uh, uh, advocate. That uh, usually when the courts uh, instruct Parliament uh, to to remedy uh, any defects. Usually that process will then start uh, from the NA and then comes uh, back to the, the NCOP. So I was just checking, even if uh, say plan SA were to come uh, with the correct wording, um, in, in, which uh, in a way would be to remedy uh, the defect that have been identified by the court, uh, even though you say we don't have to agree with the wording of the court, uh, shouldn't, all, all that process that has to do with the instruction from court have to first go to the National Assembly before it comes to uh, uh, the, the National Council of Provinces. Uh, linked to that, uh, what effect uh, does uh, this court decision have on the current uh, amendment bill that uh, will, we are uh, dealing with? Uh, uh, right now. Any, can you then uh, uh, maybe respond, uh, uh, Advocate? Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, I'm going to put my video on, but I hope uh, if, if, I, if I break up, please just let me know. Um, Chair, in fact, you are right. This is the first time that I'm aware of where there's already a bill before a house. Um, at when there's a constitutional court judgment and there my power just went out, but I think I should still be fine. Um, so this is the first time that we have something like this. The only way that the judgment will affect the, um, this bill is if we are recommending amendments. What we will have to do is to see whether those amendments can be um, derived through negotiating mandates. If we cannot do that, then another option would be to approach the portfolio committee 
In fact, if we do it as a 76 bill, we can actually do this as a committee bill, even in the NCRP. It doesn't have to be in the in the NA. It depends on whether it's a section 76.3, if it can be introduced in the NCRP. But then we can approach either the portfolio committee or the select committee for a uh, committee bill that will simply address those amendments. So, so there are many options. It is a bit out of the ordinary. It's not something that we normally do. In fact, this way I am consulting with the with the applicant in the matter is also a bit out of the ordinary. But the reason I'm doing that is because the bill is already before the committee. Uh, normally, we leave all that work for the department to do. But now it is before Parliament. So it's Parliament's duty to make sure that the bill reads well. And we will make sure of that from, from our side. But like I say, the only way that this affects the bills before the committee is if there are amendments. And then there are ways that we will deal with it. If, if, if one solution doesn't work, we do have backup solutions. And we will make sure that we, that we make that time um, that the court has given us. Thank you, Chair. I was just interested uh, to what were the argument of the department because it was the one that was taken to court. Uh, how did they lose the case? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Masocha can respond. Um, Chair, thank you very much. And also to the advocate. Um, for now, Chair, I think I will request if my colleagues are in the platform still from um, the advocate uh, Kamba, if maybe she would like to speak to the legalities around the blind SA matter, because I know that they did do some work around it with uh, Ms. Marisa van Niekerk. Um, through you, Chair, if you allow me. Yes, indeed. Um, advocate, um, I'm not sure if you are in the platform. If you are, no. can you assist with that issue? because I know that the team from Legal Services did extensive work around it. Uh, Ms. Van Nicker can also speak to it. Marissa, over to you. Uh, thank you, DVT. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, just in brief, Chairperson, the instructions, I didn't deal with this matter specifically, however, the instructions that we received from um, the Ministry's office was to uh, abide by the uh, by the application, uh, because Minister also was of the opinion that we, we cannot discriminate against um, a people who's not able to access these materials. Um, so it was not opposed, um, a notice to abide was filed. I don't know if I could come by, wish to add more, but that is just the gist of it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. Afternoon, Chairperson and uh, members. No, uh, I have nothing to add, Chairperson. Uh, we abided by the application. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So it was not opposed. Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, I think at this stage, uh, if there are no further comments uh, uh, from members, uh, um, I will then uh, ask uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister uh, to make uh, closing remarks. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair, and thanks for the for the time uh, uh, that we have afforded us this afternoon to make the presentation. Just uh, on the blind SA matter, Chair, you you would know that ordinarily we would uh, uh, from the and the minister and the detective side would uh, adopt a progressive approach on matters like this. So it would have been order to oppose a, a, a case that has got to do with that, especially pertaining to people with uh, disabilities. So I'm sure you agree that uh, it, would, uh, it was a cor correct uh, uh, approach to adopt. With regard to the, all of the issues that we discussed in the... Another man asks that uh, the... The, the president's reservations be clearer in the presentation. So I know that uh, on a, uh, uh, Dr. Masocha did uh, uh, list them. Uh, so maybe we can still do something there to uh, uh, make them more pronounced. And uh, I know given what uh, Dr. both Dr. Masocha, yourself and advocate uh, for now said, 
So that issue <laughs> has now moved. So um, there's been lo lots of water under, under the bridge. But at the beginning, there were strong views that uh, we should just confine ourselves to the reservations by the president. So Dr. Masocha did explain what happened with regard to treaty implications and uh, some of the things that came out of the public participation process. But uh, given the retaking, so, and what had the advocate uh, Fernand Merve had now explained, and uh, you did uh, make reference to this in your know, opening remarks. So the process is now quite open. So the legislature is going to decide uh, how it's going to, to manage it. I was very interested in hearing uh, the advocate for the member before we leave. I know what uh, the, uh, the uh, Dr. Masocha's position would have been on the retaking uh, and the implications of the retaking. So she went, the advocate went through that. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, very useful uh, to know. And uh, as he says, this uh, looks uh, fairly like an <laughs> extraordinary situation. So it could take some time. So we, we are quite uh, anxious that we can go through a process that can ensure firstly that we can uh, finalize the process in line with the, uh, the court judgment, and the, but that we the bills can be returned, can be finalized and returned back to, to the president. Now, with uh, the participation of the, the provinces and the consultation process we're going to have, uh, so from the side of the department, we will, uh, we will uh, be guided by what the, the, the legislature decides on how to manage that process. And I can only say that we'll be quite ready, at, um, uh, especially Dr. Masocha's branch, uh, to come back uh, to you to... Uh, if there are any requests that are made that uh, we should uh, um, uh, give more information with regard to helping the process going forward. So we can only hope uh, that with all the, the so as, you, as they would say that the, the process is now wide open. So we can only hope that uh, it will be, it will be uh, finalized uh, soon during the course of the next year. Um, but with that, Chair, thanks, thanks very much. It's always very uh, educative to at, attend these meetings and to, to hear where the members of the of, of Parliament are coming from, so that these uh, views can guide the uh, the work that we we do as the department. So I'm not going to I'm not going to complain at all about uh, the. The work that the legislature must do because the legislature must do its work. So there's a lot of uh, criticism we get that we spend a lot of time in processes that are necessary, that are robust, consistent with our own type of democracy. But uh, uh, that robust process leaves with little time to enable us to take actions that uh, impact on ordinary people's lives. So, but uh, we've got to find a proper balance. So we'll we'll wait for the legislature to finalize its process, and uh, uh, we we hope that with time uh, the bill say uh, can be finalized and they sent back to the president for his assent. Thanks very much uh, for your time, and thanks to uh, the all members, and thanks to Dr. Masoja for the presentation, and to the advocate. I, there are things I didn't quite understand uh, clearly until the rotate mm -hmm. makes that presentation. It was very useful, especially on those matters yeah. of taking and the extraordinary circumstances we are currently in. So I mm -hmm. think that was uh, very useful. So it will help us uh, at least uh, also temper our expectations with regard to how fast the, the legislature will be able to move to finalize the, the bills. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable TM. Um, uh, I, I suggest that also, uh, if uh, advocate, uh, even though we will be together with her throughout the process, if uh, she could uh, uh, say the, that last presentation uh, with us uh, as members and also uh, members of the legislature, and I think possible also with the department as well. Um, 
let, let me then take this opportunity to again thank the deputy minister, uh, the department and the uh, CIPC, um, and also all the officials from the department. Uh, let me thank the honorable members, the members of the committee. I see my internet is unstable. I hope I can be heard. Uh, the honorable members from the legislature that have been with us throughout. Uh, I, I understand that some of the members had to join uh, the, the plenary sessions. Uh, we thank uh, very much those who are with us. As I indicated in the morning, uh, that uh, these proceedings are recorded. Uh, uh, members can go back uh, uh, even uh, to last week's first uh, workshop, uh, go through that uh, uh, and also link it with the uh, presentation uh, that we receive on the two bills. It's something that I will be doing myself, uh, you know, because uh, as, as we all agree, these, these, these two bills are very technical in nature. Uh, so they need the further uh, understanding in terms of the concepts uh, and uh, uh, also the, the 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 conceptual framework uh, in, you know and all and and all those things um so that's what I'll be doing especially that we agree that uh, it's going to take us some time so I may I will also use even the December period uh, to go through those uh, videos uh, uh, on YouTube or get uh, the link from uh, the committee secretaries. Uh, that's why I'm encouraging other members also to do the same. Um, my great uh, my fear is on this briefing uh, to the provinces uh, uh, that at the week of the first uh, to the fifth, I would uh, humbly request the PLOs uh, to please liaise with their uh, legislatures and also uh, the permanent delegates uh, to ensure that uh, the week of the 1st to the uh, 5th uh, of November, uh, we at least uh, finalize uh, those uh, uh, briefings. The uh, department is made aware so that they can also allocate uh, officials that will be going to the provinces. I suspect that uh, there will be uh, virtual, so they don't need to travel to the provinces, but they will have to connect to individual uh, provinces, getting the link from the legislature's concern. So my fear is around that, because if uh, we have a delay around that, then it will affect uh, the whole process. Um, as I indicated, we will share that process, uh, legislative process with the, with the department so that they also prepare uh, themselves. Um, I think other than that, uh, again, I will thank uh, uh, everybody. And let's say, committee secretary, the, something that I'm leaving out. Um, no, Chi, you covered everything. Okay. Um, but Chi, what, 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 we, what we will maybe do is um, we'll just, from the provincial liaison offices, we'll just get the schedule of um, when every province is going to be having the provincial briefings. And um, yeah. we can just circulate that. That will really help here yeah, because that's the area I'm worried about. Yeah. All right. No, thank you very much uh, again, uh, DM uh, and the officials, uh, honorable members. Thank you very much uh, for uh, attendance. Uh, so, as from next week, we'll be then starting with the uh, uh, other leg of the process in terms of uh, uh, briefings to our provinces, and then we take it from there. Thank you so much, uh, Advocate, uh, for assisting and uh, clarifying uh, some of the issues. Because I also had uh, was of the view that uh, we we'll only deal with uh, uh, those uh, areas that uh, the president had uh, reservations on. But then you clarify uh, to us uh, that uh, the the everything now started afresh uh, in terms of uh, the, the, these bills. Uh, especially now that they are Section 76 bill. Thank you for clarifying some of those issues, uh, including, uh, we'll go into details, as you say, uh, in November. Um, we still have uh, two other meetings with the department, uh, the TIC deputy minister, uh, will uh, still uh, interact uh, before the end of the year. Thank you very much, everybody. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you, Chairperson.
थैंक यू